Okay, everyone, welcome to the 106th Sustainability Salon. Um, today, we are going to talk about relationships between pandemics and air. Um, where's my other mask? Well, somewhere around here. Um, so we could all put on our masks. This is... Um, not the mask that is going to be featured today, although we can talk about it too, especially if my daughter Keelan, who made it, comes. It's a very fine mask, homemade. Um, I don't know how well the microphone works through it, so I'll take it off. But I just figured I'd add that in in honor of the pandemic. And tell us, I'm going to mute you again because there is too much background. So, so everybody is muted now. And um, the way we'll work this, as we usually do, uh, is if you have, just in general, stay muted unless you're speaking, because uh, even a little bit of background noise can add up when there's a whole bunch of people uh, logged on. And I got quite a lot of RSVPs for this salon, so I'm looking forward to uh, a great deal of uh, significant number of people and a lot of great discussion. So we certainly welcome uh, questions and input and thoughts and experiences. Um, but the best place to start them out is in the chat. And we will, um, uh, well, Mark Dixon couldn't be with us today, which is sad to say because he is a, often really great to have monitoring the chat, and B, this is a topic very near and dear to his heart. So I should note, um, I am recording the session and hope to uh, post it uh, on YouTube later for people who can't make it. But in general, I really encourage people to come to attend salons if at all possible, because it is very much our uh, sizable crowds and great discussion that makes uh, sustainability salons what they are. Um, and I will be checking for late, late RSVPs. Some people, I finally did figure out how to get Eventbrite to send you the Zoom registration info, but uh, some people RSVP by email, so I need to check for that every so often but our folks are rolling in, that's terrific. Um, so today we are talking about a variety of relationships between pandemics and air. Uh, air quality, air pollution, and, uh, and just the air itself. Let me get those lights out of the background. So, um, uh, I kept hearing little, bits of research that have been uh, differently backed up, um, but they're uh, in terms of how chronic exposure to air pollution um, might affect vulnerability to infection and even death rates from infection. Um, it's very difficult to pull out that particular influence, although it's a very, it seems kind of obvious to me and probably to a lot of you and certainly to people who have respiratory problems already from air pollution. Um, but we won't really know until the research is done. Um, so there's people working on this all around the world, um, but it's still early for this pandemic, but this isn't the first pandemic. Uh, and the 1918 pandemic that was nicknamed not very accurately the Spanish flu um, was it was a bit simpler although there was a war going on so that added complication um, but right now we have politics entered in and, and that could be even a bigger influence because you have people who are just ignoring the um, uh, need to wear masks. 
So we'll be talking about uh, how transmission works, um, aerosols and droplets. We'll be talking about masks. Um, uh, my daughter, Keelan, who made a whole lot of masks. Here's many examples of her fine handiwork here. Um, many different styles uh, may be joining us. She wasn't sure if she'd have a conflict, but we also have with us the uh, filter ex filtration expert um, at Breathe 99, and I will, uh, she's here with us. Um, we will be looking at the air pollution to vulnerability issue, both from the um, 1918 pandemic, uh, where some research at CMU was done re looking retrospectively. We'll have Edson Severnini and uh, uh, Bernard Goldstein, who is the, was the uh, Dean of the Pitt, University of Pittsburgh Graduate School for Public Health um, and previously worked in government, was a Deputy Director of the EPA for Research and Development and was on all these committees that was figuring things out as they were navigating how to implement the Clean Air Act and all this, um, and is still active, uh, actively advocating for taking these things into consideration, but also is keeping an eye on all the research. So he's gonna give a bird's eye view of, of the various research that is going on, as well as current uh, efforts to um, get the, EPA to take this into consideration uh, as they set limits for polluters, which they're always adjusting, um, and which polluters sometimes ignore anyway, or have problems that cause them to exceed. And we know all too well about that here in Pittsburgh. Um, and uh, there's another relationship with air quality, which is that we had an economic shutdown um, and it's sort of open and shut and open and shut and open and different facilities and different businesses are uh, adjusting in various ways. And some other folks at Carnegie Mellon were paying attention to uh, how that affected our regional air pollution because we have quite a bit of uh, excess air pollution in our region with uh, the steel industry is not what it once was, but we still have some steel facilities, coke making facilities, which for those out of the areas where you um, bake coal uh, to drive off impurities and you get what you get out is called coke, which is pure carbon that's ingredient in the steel making process. But um, the coke making process, turning coal into coke is very dirty and um, so that's our biggest polluter in this region at this point is uh, a coke plant. And then there's also a few remaining steel plants and lots of other industrial facilities here. Um, and more being created with the uh, petrochemical plant that's going in just north of, northwest of Pittsburgh. Uh, so, we're gonna start off with um, somebody who is here and it looks like he's in a faraway mountain valley in China maybe, is that China, Neil? But really he's just in the next room over there. Um, my spouse, uh, Neil Donahue, who's a professor at Carnegie Mellon in uh, chemistry, chemical engineering and engineering and public policy and who is a world expert on particles, atmospheric particles, doing frontiers of science research in how they develop, how they evolve in the atmosphere, uh, and off relates air pollution and climate change, which affect each other. Um, and uh, was a signatory on a uh, significant letter that was written by a whole bunch of scientists to the World Health Organization to make sure that they were getting advisories right as they tell people all around the planet what to do in the face of COVID um, because there's the cough and sneeze droplets, but there's also aerosols which are uh, 
much tinier and can stay airborne much longer. So one of the reasons that um, anytime, especially if you're indoors, uh, masks are so important. So, uh, and then following that, we'll hear about this amazing Breathe 99 mask, which I have to go over there to get my version of and model it. <laughs> we have Allison here all uh, queued up, um, who is the filter expert at Breathe 99. So, uh, all right. Um, uh, what is happening here? I'm confused as to why I'm seeing that screen. I need to sort this out for a moment because we're seeing the, for the sake of the recording, we are seeing the wrong screen. We might just have to do it by pinning. Okay. Um, yeah, I'm seeing Phyllis's screen for some reason. All right. Well, I will manually change what we're looking at. And uh, for now, I will give it to Neil. Take it away, Neil. Well, thank you. Uh, it's Switzerland, by the way. It's Switzerland. Not China. Okay. Yep. I'm, I'm seeing the these really tall um, waterfalls. Yeah. Is that it's one of the mountains the, you were near the, near the base Near the base of the Eiger. Um, but uh, once upon a time, I used to travel around the world a lot. <laughs> I haven't been on an airplane since last uh, February. Um, so yeah, thanks much. Uh, I'll, I'll try to be quite brief um, and also to emphasize that, so that letter, the driving force uh, behind a lot of that work uh, by aerosol scientists uh, has been um, my colleagues, Lydia Moroska in Australia, uh, Lindsay Marr at Virginia Tech has gotten a great deal of well-deserved um, attention to the point uh, where she's almost impossible to reach. Um, and one of the things about Lydia is, is uh, uh, sorry, Lindsay, is that she's been working on aerosol transmission of diseases for years. Um, actually, she noticed kind of as, as an aerosol scientist, um, she was kind of paying attention to what was going on in her kid's preschool and, and when people seemed to get sick and, and thought, huh, it doesn't, all seem to have to do with surfaces and kids are sneezing and things all the time and I know about particles. Um, so she's been doing that for more than a decade and I like to tell people it's if you get a chance to listen to people who already were experts on something and thinking about something before uh, it became the topic du jour, um, there's a good chance that, that they have a better idea what they're talking about than um, if you listen to someone like me, uh, who I did know a lot about aerosols, but I didn't know anything about masks um, and very little about filtration. I'm, I will share a couple of uh, slides uh, just to, to give you a sense of things, but not, not very many. Um, I don't want to be too much of a wonky uh, talk. But suffice it to say that the, uh, you know, so we aerosol folks became concerned very quickly with the notion that the, uh, the, the disease transmission was being, uh, had to do largely with, with uh, nasal droplets or breathing droplets, that the stuff you can see uh, and is gross when someone sneezes basically. Uh, and so we were pondering very quickly what the, the meaning of this six foot separation uh, actually was. And there's actually a really interesting history to that um, that goes way back in epidemiology. And perhaps Bernie will be able to, uh, to relate some of those stories as well. Uh, and, and actually has a, um, has a history in the desire of epidemiologists and public health uh, uh, officials to, um, to, to dissuade people from the notion of miasmas and, and bad vapors, bad air, being the source of disease propagation, uh, and instead focus on um, germs uh, and things that could relay germs uh, in, in some of the famous uh, uh, transmission cases in the, the, uh, the cholera well and other things like that. Uh, and so the idea that, that just air is a trans, transmission vector for disease um, was, was a concept that, that early public health communication was fighting against. Um, and, and that is actually, we think, one of the reasons why um, us aerosol folks experienced 
quite significant pushback. It was extremely difficult to get people to focus in on, on the role of aerosol particles. Um, and, and so there, there are two little, two things that I just sort of want to give a sense of reflection on this. Uh, you know, so very quickly it became evident that um, a portion of the uh, transmission at least did have something to do uh, with with aerosols. So there are two things going on. One was was kind of worrying, wondering about how the uh, propagation, how the, the people were actually catching this thing. Uh, and then the other one was wondering about, well, people are wearing masks and what do they do? Um, and I, I will, this is not quite the historical order, but it's about the historical order. So I got in touch with with my colleague Jose Jimenez at the University of Colorado, uh, who's a close friend and colleague, and is, was another of the, I would say, the third uh, in that triumvirate of people who've really been focusing uh, hard on this problem. Um, and he he sort of sent me this this letter they were working on uh, to to uh, uh, to sign in on. Um, and one of the what it what it was starting to happen very quickly is there were case studies uh, in the early epidemiology uh, looking at, at, at trying to uh, you know, figure out if there were, if there were examples where, uh, where we could learn something about how the, the, the um, COVID was actually being transmitted. You remember that, that cruise ship? Um, I have no idea why people still go on cruise ships, but um, I hope we don't have any industry people on the line here. Uh, but uh, but the, the one that was wound up docking in, um, in in Japan for a while and had a very large number of cases. Uh, but there was another case, um, and let me share my screen if I may here. Uh, we're looking for, not you, we're looking for you here. Uh, so there was a restaurant, whoops, no, that is not the right, well, it'll work, but um, yeah, I'll just stick with that one. Uh, so this is in a, in a, a paper from the journal MedX, uh, and there was a, 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 a restaurant in uh, Guangzhou, China, um, so in the Pearl River de Delta. Um, I have a, actually a, a recently graduated PhD student from Guangzhou, um, and uh, was there a couple of years ago. Beautiful town, um, and this was just after Chinese New Year, uh, and so a, a family member had traveled from uh, 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 from Wuhan uh, to Guangzhou, uh, and uh, then what, they went out to dinner. Um, and actually, I have another PhD student who is from Wuhan uh, and was actually in Wuhan uh, in uh, early January, um, and then was isolating. Come, came back to the to the U.S. and very without any prompting said, "I'm I'm staying at home for two weeks." Uh, I said, okay, um, that sounds prudent. Thank you very much. And, and by the time he was, he's back and healthy and uh, he's always healthy, but uh, um, it became evident that this was a really big deal very quickly. Uh, so, so this, this, this is this, this restaurant in, uh, and this is a recreation of, of sort of the scene of this restaurant in, in Guangzhou. Um, I asked people I know from Guangzhou, can you figure out which restaurant it is? And they said, there, <laughs> there's like 100,000 restaurants in Guangzhou. No, I don't know which one it is. But, but the, the context was, um, let me turn on my little, little sort of spotlight thingy. You see my little marker here. Um, the, the, the restaurant, so this is kind of the front the entrance is here. We're looking toward the back. It's a single room. Uh, and, and the restaurant was a, has an air conditioning system in it. And it's the sort of air conditioners that sit up on the ceiling. You know, they're little units there on the ceiling. They have a little fan. They got some coils to, to put, add cooling in. Uh, and, uh, and then they, so they suck air in and they blow it back out. And they're just, they're, they're, so it's not a duct system and some central air or anything like that. It's just a unit sitting on the ceiling. Uh, and, they, and they actually, I think there were four, I think there were actually five of them. Yeah, there's another one down here. Uh, but there are four of them lined up along this kind of back wall or side wall of this restaurant. And the, and the circulation uh, that these set up uh, is like this. So it's drawn here in this, in this collection of people in the back, um, which is going to be of relevance here. Um, but so each of these units more or less had its own um, air. Uh, but there's no other barriers. These aren't private dining rooms or whatnot that you find often in Chinese restaurants. This was just in the back of the main 
room of a relatively small restaurant here. And so each of these sections of tables had, uh, had, had an air conditioner and it's roughly blowing like this. This one here was counter, you know, was at 90 degrees. And so there was some stirring going on here as well. But the, the section in the back, which had three tables, uh, was, um, was reasonably isolated by that. And this is the actual population uh, of, of folks in the restaurant at the time. And they were, you know, this is a New Year's celebration. They spent several hours there. You see, it's packed. So the restaurant was absolutely packed. And these, this, this group of people on the back table, um, the, the, the patient zero, who had come from uh, Wuhan and turned out to be uh, either it's starting to experience symptoms that day or became ill the next, uh, is in purple here. Uh, their family is around here. And then two other completely independent uh, parties were dining here. They had no physical contact with one another, uh, and uh, but they they were they were kind of there for of order an hour uh, or two. I think the full time that this this party was there for was two and change hours, and the other groups were there for a significant chunk of that time. Everybody in red got sick. So about half of the of the patrons. This is two people at this table. Uh, one, two, three people at that, four people at that table, um, three out of four people at this table got ill. Uh, and actually, you see the incidence rates, these are family, presumably, so these people may have had contact outside of the restaurant. These folks had no association with the, with the patient zero whatsoever. They all got sick. Nobody else did in the restaurant. Uh, in fact, the serving staff, nobody, nobody got ill. So there were people going in and out of this relatively frequently to serve them and, and, and talk to them and whatnot. Um, and there's no really strong association within this group uh, with distance. They're just in this swirling mass of air. Um, and there are numerous other cases at this point. A single case studies never tell you explicitly everything that's going on, but if you understand them, they do give you hints of what's going on. There's a few different cases. There was a chorus in, in Washington state. There was another chorus in uh, the Netherlands. Uh, and there's a few other examples where large numbers of people became ill who were in a room together uh, with no evident relationship with how far they were away from one another. And this absolutely jumps out to an aerosol scientist because the thing about um, particles, uh, so first of all, you should know that it was very quickly established that the sort of the size of the virus itself is 100 nanometers or so. So it's a, it's a little cluster of, of DNA um, that is, uh, it's about 100 in a little package, about 100 nanometers in size. Um, one thing nobody really seems to know yet is, is how many of them you need to, uh, to, to actually get embedded, uh, settled into your body to, to, be, to have a high chance of becoming ill, but that's, a, that's another topic. Um, but nonetheless, the individual particles, are, uh, virons, are, are 100-ish nanometers. Your, um, any, any, any particles that come from your breathing or sneezing or whatnot are wet, um, but they're not water. Uh, they have salts in them, they've got mucus in them, they've got some proteins in them. And so by the time when that particle gets out of your, your moist 100% humidity airstream and then into the air, it's going to shrink, but it's not going to completely disappear. And um, I've spent a fair bit of work done in what particles come out of people's mouths when they're doing things like singing or talking. Um, not necessarily sneezing. That was another thing that was coming out a lot. Is it, it's not people just at you sneezing and then everyone next to them gets sick. So we're hearing all of this stay six feet apart stuff. And then we're seeing instances like this case study here, uh, the, the coral state case studies and everything. And again, as aerosol scientists, we understand that, that the stuff that falls within six feet or so, this is terminal velocity. This is why a squirrel can miss a branch and not die. Whereas if I was jumping from branch to branch like Tarzan and Tarzan and missed, it would be very bad for me uh, because the squirrel has a low terminal velocity just because it's got a lot of surface area. It's not entirely just because it's fluffy and furry. It's just small. It's why a fly can crawl across the ceiling and, and, and droplets and particles are uh, the smaller they get, the more they float around. And only the kind of spittle, um, 
uh, sneeze particles, again, the ones you can see, will actually fall to the ground in a six feet or so. And they're huge. There are, there are um, about 100 micrometers in diameter, uh, whereas the particles that come out, the virons are 100 nanometers in diameter, a thousand times smaller. And the particles that we typically breathe out are, are one to 10 nanometers in size, mostly. It varies, but that seems to be uh, the, the kind of ballpark range. Well, that one nanometer size is actually why aerosols are such a big deal in the first place, uh, because they are small enough that they just don't fall down at any significant rate. It takes days and days and days for a one nanometer, uh, sorry, a one micrometer particle to drift down even through tens of meters. And so for all practical purposes, they are suspended in air. The way they leave the atmosphere in general is by rain. They get sucked into a water droplet and then that thing goes out of the atmosphere quickly, but they, they basically don't fall. Um, so that got us puzzled. Uh, but also, they're small enough that they, when you breathe in, they don't, you know, they're, they're if, if our dog is running after one of our cats, she's mm, significantly heavier. She's not, she's not a, a chubby big dog, but she's heavier than the cats and they, they can turn a corner faster than she can. She'll tend to bounce off the walls. Um, and because she can't turn as well. Uh, and when she, she's a little dog, she's a terrier, she, when she's being chased by a big dog in the dog park, um, turning quick is her, her that's her game, right? Because the big Labrador or whatever, it can't turn quickly. And the little less massive thing can, can, is much quicker and turns much faster. And particles are the same way. Uh, so little particles, when you breathe in, they got through your nasal tract. Your nasal tract's job is to take dust out. That's why it has all of that, you know, why things go up into your nose and back down into your throat and everything, because it's filtering out pollen and dust and things. And that might give you allergies and make you miserable, but it prevents the particles from getting into your lungs. Well, the aerosol particles go right by all that stuff and they get into the lungs because they're small. But they're also Goldilocks particles because when you get really small, then um, you, so you start to become directly fidgety, you diffuse. Uh, and so gas molecules can start to, to, to just, because they get hit by other molecules, they have energy, it's called Brownian diffusion, just kind of random diffusion. So really little things are very diffusive. Really big things are, the, uh, they have enormous amounts of momentum and so they can't turn corners but the Goldilocks around one nanometer, one, sorry, micrometer in size, 100 nanometers to a micrometer or so, that's where things can get into your lungs, where the aerosol particles deposit, uh, uh, cause um, not direct, uh, talk, there, there's some, in some cases it's direct toxicity, but mostly what happens is your, your, your body responds with an inflammatory response to the, uh, the presence of particles and such. Um, which ultimately increases rates of heart attacks. That's, that's why into just aerosol pollution is a big deal. If it's a virus, then if you breathe it in and it gets into your lung, it can, it can settle in. And you know, that's the other thing that's for a very long time been evident in, this, uh, in, in, in the, uh, the pandemic is that the sort of deep lung infections are a significant part of this um, issue. So, the particle, the, 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 the aerosols are, are floating around a lot. Um, and if you're in a space like this restaurant where over a significant amount of time, the population of the, air, the virons, the aerosols builds up and you're breathing a lot of them and you don't have filtration, then your vulnerability gets greater and greater and greater and greater. The second thing, and I'll shut up, is so we started to think about masks and I knew nothing about masks at the time uh, and masks and filters have the exact same problem as as you know the reason why aerosols are uh, get into your lung well is because they're small enough that as I said they don't have momentum um, so much and they can get around corners uh, but they're big enough so they're not highly diffusive and 
when I first heard of people, um, you know, like my daughter making masks that I now wear, I heard of these masks, I said, they're not going to work. I mean, you have to work really, really hard to make a, um, a, a filter that actually is really good at catching particles. We do this when we collect them to do, to do air quality measurements. And it's, there, there's Wattman Filter Company. And I eventually, over the course of a few days, you can find my old Facebook. But my first response was, these things won't work. Um, my second response was, well, yeah, you might be able to get half the particles. Uh, and the, by the way, the reason that they sort of might not work well is, is because if the space is too big, um, then it's that it's there's no way to diffuse to the uh, other than very tiny particles can will will not diffuse to the the fibers of the mask. Um, obviously, if it's way too big, then things will just zip through it because it's like a fly going through a screen, um, and and so you'll have this gap. Uh, uh, again, around a, a, a micrometer or so in size, where particles will just go right through. Um, and sort of step by step, I learned filtration and I learned about, so the two elements that are a big deal are having a variety of fiber sizes and free fibers out there uh, so that, that, that things will have a higher probability of running directly into the particle. I discovered that the company that makes our filters knows what they're doing. Uh, and they, they're actually designed and they work, you know, so you get air that, you know, they're not so solid that you can't suck air through them, but they do have the right distribution of particle sizes and the, the optimal thickness so that the probability that they'll catch any particle is, is very high. And then finally, there's electrostatics, which is another of the variables in here that if you can, uh, you can make use of charge, you can greatly increase the Probabilities so you always know about different types of fibers that you can run rub together and get a um, uh, an effect from uh, from 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 uh, static charge. Um, so different different fibers that have different intrinsic uh, surface polarity and charge can be a big help in in taking particles out. So I eventually realized that they yeah they could kind of work. And Lindsay and others have been me uh, doing measurements on all sorts of different DIY masks. Uh, but then also, from a public health perspective, and even from a me perspective, if, if a mask is 50, even 50 percent effective, we'll talk about the, the other people will talk about much better masks than that. That's a big deal. I, I care about it. If, something, if, if a measure is going to make me is going to, is going to make me you know, half as likely to get sick um, if I'm wearing it, and also make me half as likely to transmit it if I'm ill. Uh, and then, so if you're wearing a mask and I'm wearing a mask, then that's broadly, you know, 25% uh, of the original chance of, of, of someone, somebody becoming ill. That's an enormous deal. I would, I'll, I'll bank on a factor of four improvement in my chance of getting this disease any day. And from the public health perspective, that's the difference between something that's growing exponentially and something that's dwindling. Um, and so that's the other factor in here that's greatly important. Um, so that's, that's kind of my context for kind of framing this, but I'll stop with that and turn it over to the people who really know what they're talking about. Well, I think that you know a lot of what you're talking about. So, um, uh, I gotta just clear up my windows so um thank you neil um and i think that you are selling yourself short because in addition to your long-standing expertise in how particles work um you have spent a lot of time uh paying attention to this uh, I've seen to, I don't know if you're still doing this, but for months during the first part of this pandemic, you were posting a, a statistical analysis of what was going on every Monday. And uh, with yeah, I gave other, up. You gave up because the pandemic is still with us. Sorry, didn't. I did. By the way, I forgot to say two things, so I'll jump back in. One is that um, you reminded me that I was supposed to say something about like fomite, fomite, and, and washing surfaces and things. Mm -hmm. um, and to my knowledge, there's just not very much evidence that that's a major transmission pathway for this pathogen. 
um, that it, the, the, but, but there, there was a, um, actually just, I think yesterday, Baruch Fischoff, uh, published an editorial that I can circulate to people, uh, because there's been a few epi studies of mask effectiveness. One in Denmark was published just the other day and got a fair bit of press because it's hard to find, um, a robust statistical evidence to back the, the the actual, you know, did you wear a mask? Did you not wear a mask? Is the rate of infection higher? There's lots of anecdotal mask about uh, mask use, evidence about mask usage correlating with reduced uh, transmission rates in a whole sea of other, and people are doing everything they can to be in some parts of the world and in some parts of this country to be, to try to be safe. Um, and so where people have, have attempted to find real A-B comparisons that have statistical significance, it's been difficult. Um, and Baruch, who's, a, who's a, um, an expert on risk communication at Carnegie Mellon and a member of uh, several national academies, including medicine and uh, the National Academy of Science, has been on a panel about COVID risk communication. And, and uh, he was, he was, um, uh, has a dim view of, uh, not of that study, but of the, uh, the, of, of, of waiting until we have rock solid evidence to take reasonable public health measures. Uh, and so even though, as far as I know, there's very little evidence for washing surfaces being, uh, very effective in reducing transmission. Um, there is a precautionary principle element that says it's probably a good idea to wash your hands. Uh, and only to the extent that we devote, you know, the, ha the, 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 the moral hazard issue is if we're devoting so much resources to, um, you know, at my university at Carnegie Mellon right now, this semester, they've been spending 30 minutes every single class. And we've spread our calendar out so that the, the, the custodial staff can come in and clean classrooms in between classes for the very few people who are actually going in. And you, that may be devoting so much resources to a specific area of intervention that one might neglect other things. But so, so the, as far as I understand it, um, surface fomite transmission is probably not a big deal with this. But um, on the other hand, do reasonable things to be safe. So the, the precautionary principle plays a huge role in public policy and advice here. Now I'll shut up. There was, well, you might have to speak more. Um, there was, uh, there's somebody who I, I haven't found the time to go back in my notes and look, but I was at some environmental Zoom meeting with someone who works at a organization in our region now doing environmental work, but in a former life, she was in infectious disease and she said that the whole hang up about bags, bags, people shopping into their bags at stores had to do with um, uh, one case of some of a woman that had SARS and vomited into her pocketbook, her purse, and then later took cookies to some community event in that bag. And that a lot has been made of that one case. And I don't, I have not um, found the real information on that, but she, the person I was talking with uh, seemed confident of the anecdote. Um, so, so yeah, whether you wash your milk bottles, whether we wash our milk bottles uh, when we bring them in, how much handling have they had? How likely is it that someone's, basically it's if someone sneezed on it. Now there were a couple questions in the chat. Um, uh, does anybody who's currently on the call have a better, have, have any kind of recent information on the virus starting in a wet market or a lab? Um, I think the escape from a lab Max, a little bit of pandemic and conspiracy theories and such. Um, I'm, there's certainly plenty of zoonotic diseases that come from animals, and there's a lot of animals in intimate contact with each other and with humans. 
And so... I don't think there's any evidence that came out of a lab, but I mean, it, it's also to some extent kind of irrelevant. Um, it's here. Uh, but whether it was that wet market or whether there was another vector coming out of a, an animal, these the, the um, coronaviruses are well understood to come from bats and other um, mm -hmm. other sources. I, I think that's been known for a very long time. So mm -hmm. there's no reason to expect this is any different from that. Whether which specific market or which specific vector is of interest, but is almost totally irrelevant at this point. Mm -hmm. And uh, let's see, Karen asked um, about whether anyone in the restaurant the following day may or thereafter may have gotten sick from this one person and neil i don't know if you want to say yeah i just that so they did i mean the, the, this was a full contract trace that that people were not dropping down sick in three hours if i if i got cast that idea uh this was what, when they did the contract tracing after uh this k they noticed very quickly that a whole bunch of people got sick who went to that restaurant some days later uh and then did the the contract contact tracing, and so the other people who I said did not get sick, who were in the in the forward part of the restaurant, didn't get sick. I mean, this was done weeks or month after uh, late January. You're saying uh, the contact tracing was done later, or they were the in the restaurant? The con no, no, no. The con there was people were in the restaurant at the same at the time. time. So yeah, this is that's another thing is that the particles the idea that particles travel around the atmosphere for weeks does not mean that you're just if you're walking down the street breathing um, there's any significant evidence that you're going to drop down sick that the exposure the 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 way this I commented kind of off the cuff that we don't really know whether it's like kind of like I, my analogy is whether it's like getting shot you know whether one virus just goes in and, and deposits, but but I, I think we pretty much know that's not true because the immune response is capable of dealing with that most of the time. So the more exposure you get, the higher your risk of becoming infected is. Uh, and so it the, the, the key elements here were that people were in that airspace at the time that an, an infectious person was emitting particles for an extended period of time. Of, of you know everybody who got sick was there for more than an hour and as i said people who just walked in and out the servers in this case did not become ill so the, the abundance of evidence is that it's the building up of a concentration of infectious uh, of virons um, or infectious quanta is the jargon in the in the literature uh over over time you know so the particle concentrations like anything else if you go in a room with a smoker uh, or anything else, or you know, when when the, when something burns on the stove or whatever, it's it's the emission rate, um, the intensity of those emissions, uh, and and the ventilation that that matter. So, so this isn't. There's no evidence I'm aware of that people are getting sick via long range transmission, um, but there is evidence that the you know so so the again at my university they they kind of have little six foot circles. And they say, okay, we're going to allow um, eight people into this classroom. And I've told the, 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 the folks in charge that I think actually that's scientifically wrong. However, it's the right thing anyway, because what you're doing is you're reducing the density of people in the room and you're reducing the, you know, you're going to, uh, you know, um, reduce the overall chances that someone gets sick anyway. Yeah, it's, but stay out of, in, of it, you know, don't go to a bar. <laughs> Sorry for plain evidence, plain advice, but that's that's you know stay out of places where people are talking loudly, and are going to hang around for hours, and and then you'll rack up exposure that's got you a big chance of making you sick. Yeah, the thing with your circles, it's it's not necessarily the right thing to do, but it's better than not doing it. So it's it's safer than than otherwise but and then you add layers of safety like the sick person is wearing a mask the asymptomatic sick person is wearing a mask and the other breathers are wearing masks and the masks are as good as they can be obtained so um 
Neil is always talking about layers of safety here. Don't put anything flammable on the stove because you never know, someone might come along and turn it on. Um, I think the, the next question, so is there an issue of, of viral uh, survival in terms of, we heard early on that the virus, the live virus survived on plastic or stainless surfaces plastic or metal surfaces for days, but only hours on cardboard, as so many people are getting cardboard boxes. And my personal guess as to why that is has to do with the, um, uh, the porous surfaces are sucking moisture away and the Viron is probably drying out. So whether that is, going to happen with these teeny teeny aerosols that are floating around in the air for days um they, the 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 aerosols may still be there floating around in the air for days but the virus in them will have died because it doesn't have the moisture that it needs so is that um i think there's something about i don't i'm not a virologist but this this okay. class of virus does has or hasn't got a protective coating i think it doesn't mm -hmm. I mean, it has, obviously it's got those spikes, which are quite famous, but that's for attaching um, to the to the <laughs> target cell. But it it isn't a, an especially stout virus outside of the um, uh, outside of the body, is my understanding. But the other the uh, another thing on the flip side of the cautionary principle, precautionary principle. I mean, it, uh, there's an abundance of evidence that the dominant means of transmission is aerosol. Um, and but it and it really does seem to be dominant. But we all we have to be pretty careful about things that might be secondary, right? So because this one thing is the it's most people are getting sick because of this, and and even where I'm saying there's not much evidence for surfaces. It, let's say say five percent of transmission is happening that way, and I'm I'm just making that number up. It would be almost impossible to figure that out, right? Because it's a it's a small part, and you, you, you know, most people we have no idea how they got sick. There's not sufficient contact tracing, and so it 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 really would be very hard to, and and the, the individual experiments and in controlled settings and all they're very useful, just like our individual experiments on sort of laboratory models of aerosols in general, but they don't. They don't tell us what's actually going on in the real world. Oh, by the way, face shields, I think it's ridiculous. As an aerosol person, there was a, there was a guy in a pizzeria with a face shield where I was going to get a pizza a couple of weeks ago. I was like, oh, geez. I mean, that has that, they do nothing. <laughs> I'm sorry, they, it, it, they actually are sneeze guards. So they're protecting against the one thing that is probably meaningless. So you don't, you're not protecting yourself from anything if you wear it. And you're not really protecting anybody else from you if you wear it. They are. They have abs. I, I, again, I'm sorry to be very, very blunt, but face shields are. They have. Is my and I could be wrong, but I I would very strongly say that I don't think face shields are going to do anything. Again, in a hospital setting. So you want it's many always a caveat. In a, in a in a hospital setting, people they do. They've been shown to have. A, a final effect. This is where, I mean, they, people are being intubated. There is spray going on. There is, I mean, so, so there is, the, 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 there are situations where, um, you know, the sneeze, the, all those droplets I was talking about, the, they are also likely infectious. Um, and so it's just that it, people don't sneeze in my face very often. Um, <laughs> thank goodness. It's not a super pleasant thing. Right. And so it's just, it's protecting against something that isn't actually much of a risk, unless you are a healthcare provider and you are actively, and, and again, and that also means you're in the presence of people who are, who are infectious all the time. Um, and so then all of those things, as you say, layers of protection, but for an individual out in the world, uh, a face shield uh, who is not wearing a mask, they're using something that is maybe going to put, you know, take that last few percent of, of probability of getting infected by some pathway and protect against that. And they're going to leave 97% of the problem on the, on the floor. Um, and so masks do work. 
even if they only cut it in half and the better ones do much better than that, that's a big deal. Face shields, no. Okay. Um, yeah, unless you happen to be sneezed at. But as you say, that is not a very common thing. All right, well, um, Neil has waved his hands about much uh, about particles and a little bit about filtration. And so now um, we're going to, we are joined by Allison Lee, who um, I, I mentioned these wonderful masks and they're very impressive. Uh, they do put down on sound transmission a little, so I'll hold my microphone right in front. But a perfect seal and a high-tech filter is what makes these, uh, these masks much better than um, run-of-the-mill cloth masks or paper surgical masks or any of those. Uh, and there are some other uh, fancy uh, masks out there, but they may have just jumped into this seeing an opportunity for a market. This mask put out by Breathe 99 was actually in development more than a year ago, looking at urban pollution and wildfires as well as medical situations. And they brought on board Allison, who I will make, uh, we'll pin her up now, um, who is an engineer who can really, has really helped refine the filter medium. Um, and she can share with us the lore of, of Breathe 99. And I should note that if folks, um, when all is said and done, I don't usually have sales pitches on salons, but this is so important. And so this, this mask makes me feel safe working at elections or going into the food co-op or going into other, into a store or wherever I might need to go. Um, I still don't do that much, but I feel reasonably safe when I do, um, despite the skyrocketing numbers. We keep having record day, we've had several days around 500 pe new people, new cases of COVID in a single day here in Allegheny County, and it's just going crazy. Um, so we all need to protect ourselves and our community uh, as well as we can. So, uh, Allison, tell us about the Breathe 99. Thanks, Marin, and uh, yeah, nice to be with everyone um, from a distance. Let me. Um, when Allison is at quite a distance, she's up in Montreal. The company is yeah. based in Minneapolis, but in these days, uh, a lot of people are working remotely. And so, um, Breathe 99 is yeah. no exception. And really, that's, that's how I, I came to work at Breathe 99, was because remote work is possible. And this company really, um, you know, the idea of this mask really got off the ground in, I'll say, April, when um, the, the founder, Max, who's from Minneapolis, um, he started a Kickstarter um, for the, the second version of this mask. It's why it's called the B2 um, in the context of a pandemic, because um, realizing that a lot of the same filtration science and the principle of having a, a, a perfect seal around your nose and your mouth and um, really high quality filters that uh, whether it's urban pollution or um, other types of particles, the, the filtration principle is the same. So, so yeah, and uh, it was interestingly, about a year ago, um, for, uh, Max tried to launch this company just for urban pollution, trying to, um, be, because of a trip that he took to Singapore, where um, as a runner, he noticed that, uh, or he just, he didn't feel as though it was healthy for him to be going on on runs uh, with such high levels of pollution while he was there. Um, and so that's really, that, that was the concept that he tried to bring in the first Kickstarter with the B1 mask. Um, 
but I think in, in North America, at least, that isn't enough on the, the general consciousness. Um, and so that, that Kickstarter wasn't successful, um, but with, with the onset of the pandemic uh, and a few design revisions to this mask, um, we had a very successful Kickstarter um, from April to May, uh, and then another crowdfunding campaign that really allowed us to do all the capital investments of, um, for our business, like tooling and purchasing of materials and things. And, and that's when I came on. So I'll just, uh, a bit about myself. Um, I, I came on as the filter technology lead. So trying these, uh, we have these little circular, two circular filters that go into each mask. Um, and my background is in nanotechnology engineering. Um, so the particle science and, you know, the physics of filtration are really, I think that's, that's my area of expertise. Uh, so I'll, I'll be speaking mostly to that. And I, I am also not a virologist or a public health official. So um, I, I can't give an, I don't feel comfortable giving official opinions about um, virus transmission, but I can speak on particles themselves. So, um, and I get the sense this is a very scientific, uh, science-minded audience. So I don't need to go and explain that there's different size ranges too much, but this is, this is the type of, this is the level of explanation that we give to the general public. Um, and we feel, all, you know, if, if you study particles all day, then it, it makes a lot of sense that something that's one micron versus 10 microns versus 100 microns may behave very differently and need to be filtered with, with different materials. Uh, but that's not really, uh, there's, the general public doesn't really have the same sense of, um, of size scale at, at, um, in the range of things you can't actually see. Uh, so there's the, all the different things that people are typically um, interested in filtering for respiratory health reasons. There's allergens, um, there's the urban pollution, uh, dust, um, whether you have a sensitivity or you're just a hobbyist who is woodworking. Um, there's wildfire smoke. We had a, a lot of sales in, in California and uh, Oregon this past fall. Um, and of course, biological aerosols, um, like Neil said. And all of these, all of these things, they don't have they're not just made of one thing, which makes it complicated and, and difficult to explain to the general public. Um, for example, smoke, especially uh, when something's on fire, depending what, what thing is on fire, what's burning, um, you know, there's all types of different particles. There's also gases that are given off. Um, and it could be, a, and pollution is very similar as well. There's, it, it's actually a whole range of things, but um, yeah, so, so on my next, the, the, um, the thing to know about particles, which are different, uh, and, and by this I mean not gases, so not, not the things uh, getting towards 10 nanometers or, or smaller. Particles largely behave the same um, from a filtration science perspective. So if you get a chance um, or you want to explain this to someone else, uh, NIOSH has this really great video um, on their website that just e explains um, the fact that, you know, no matter what is in that particle, um, it's the filtration science is largely the same. It's, it's a thing, you know, the, the filter doesn't care whether the thing is a stack of carbon or it's a, um, a droplet that you've, you've sneezed, you've breathed out. Um, if it's, the, the most important thing is the size of that particle that, um, that people working on filtering need to worry about. Um, and so there's, uh, I've also linked a blog post here. I'm, I'm sure Mary can share these slides afterwards if you wanna read more into the science of, of why that is and the research behind that. But um, that's, that's the, the thing that isn't necessarily intuitive then no matter, it doesn't matter so much what's in the particle, but what size it is. Um, and there's, there's various um, standards around um, filtering, um, whether it's by NIOSH, ASTM, um, depending on the use case, but the strictest standards are 
uh, on particle filtration are the ones set out by NIOSH for, um, for respirators, your N95s and such. So those are the, the standards that we used when we were designing our mask and, um, and coming up with the, the specifications for the filters that go into it. And so speaking of masks versus respirators, um, and sometimes these are used interchangeably um, just because we, we refer to our product as a mask just because that has more recognition with the general public. But strictly speaking, um, a surgical or a mask is just the, it doesn't have an airtight seal. So it's something you put over your face. You may breathe through the filter material, or the mask material rather, but you don't completely breathe through it because there's, there's air that flows in and around um, the sides of your face. But a respirator is intended to fit and seal 100% around your mouth and nose so that 100% of the air, ideally, that you inhale and exhale goes through the filter media. So it's a lot more hardcore. Um, so there's various um, tests in, um, for regulating these two uh, devices. So, um, but the big difference is that the respirator also has to be tested for fit because if, it, if it's not 100%, then, um, then you can't just rely on the filtration efficiency of the filter um, to, it, it doesn't represent your overall level of protection. So, um, but it's not just filtration when you go into, when you're talking about designing a mask or a respirator, um, it has to be breathable. Um, if it's too hard to breathe, um, then uh, you're probably going to cause air air gaps. Um, either when you're you're exhaling and you're inhaling, it's going to find that tiny little hole or create a tiny uh, create a uh, more airflow around the sides and and get in without filtering. So it does have to be a certain level of breathable. Um, and then if you're looking at these things for medical. Um, in medical situations, then there's amount of, an amount of liquid barrier protection, just flammability, um, and then the sensitivity and um, like biocompatibility since it's touching your face. So th that's the main difference between um, the, the testing regime for a respirator versus just a mask. Um, but of course, masks as well, fit matters. It still matters. Um, if you have an extremely loose mask versus a mask that fits quite well around your face, it's, it's gonna be more effective when it fits you. But um, moving on to these little um, circular filters, which are, um, that's the only disposable part of our mask. You, um, you just pop them out when you feel like you've worn them enough or there's, there's a risk they could have been contaminated. Um, then uh, and you can replace them. So in these in our filters, there are four layers. The outer two layers, these are all made of, of what you might call non-woven polypropylene materials, but there are different different grades of it. So the the two outer layers are really just for protection um, of the filtering layers so that the filtering layers last longer. And they're made of really uh, loose more loosely um, uh, non-woven uh, polypropylene. So they're really, really breathable and just basic, um, basic protection. And then the two layers that uh, do the heavy lifting um, in our filters, there is um, a spun bond polypropylene, which is, it's a less, it's a cheaper, um, easier way of producing non-woven polypropylene. Um, so the fibers in, in this electrostatic layer, um, they're a little bit, they're larger than the fibers in, in the melt blown layer. Um, but the, um, the spun bond layer has, uh, is, has electrostatic properties. So that's, that's why it's, it's effective in that it attracts particles that are, would otherwise pass through, even though the holes are a little bit bigger, um, the mesh isn't as fine. Um, it attracts particles to the, to um, stick on the surface of the filter through electrostatic forces. Um, the melt blown layer is more just um, old fashioned mechanical um, filtration where the, um, the fibers are around three microns 
in size versus I think about 15 microns in, in diameter with the spun mod. So it's a really fine, it's a dense mesh uh, essentially that traps particles. And um, so they work in conjunction, um, these two different size meshes, um, essentially when put together form a very, very effective filter. Um, and of course, um, depending on the, the quality and the consistency of, uh, of fibers and the manufacturing, there's, there's very different grades of melt blown and spun mon polypropylene. And the ones that where you can get consistently small fibers in a very, um, very uniform um, dispersion of, of, of size, you get a very even um, material and that provides high breathability and high protection. Um, as opposed to some of the, the lower grade, like even topping bags and, and things can be made out of non-woven polypropylene, but it's, it doesn't provide good filtration, either having lots of holes or being very hard to breathe through. Yeah. So that's essentially our filter. Oh, and a small note that we have two types of filters um, because in, we found individuals with respiratory conditions where they don't like just can't breathe as, as well, or they need a high amount of oxygen. And then people who do sports were interested in a more breathable filter. Uh, so we, we do sell a filter that doesn't have the melt blown layer. So it still works. The, the, poly, the spun bond layer with electrostatic attraction uh, is still um, pretty efficient. It's, it's above 90%, but it's not like near 99% as our original one is. And, and having the melt blown and the poly, the spun bond layer means that, you know, because they're working in conjunction, the filter actually lasts quite long. And according to our testing, the, the filter can, uh, like it'll get completely clogged with particles without the filtration efficiency going down. So it, it, it can last quite a long time. Um, whereas if you just have the electrostatic layer for our light filters, then you find, we found over time, uh, the electrostatic um, effects are uh, the electrostatic, um, the, the levels of, of charge of the filter decrease over time due to just uh, the contact with particles, ambient humidity. So um, having the three layers means it doesn't last as long. And so I also wanted to touch on some of the testing we do. Um, this is also, we, we did a series of filtration tests at the University of Minnesota. And what this is, is essentially, it's, it's just our filter, this, the circular filter, it's in a tube and they bombard it with um, a certain range of sodium chloride particles. And you have a particle counter on the other side that counts the, the number and the size of the particles that get through. And, and so this is like, um, these are the, the results of our test in the size range of 0.1 to 0.3 microns, which um, we, we rate our filters down to 0.1 microns, which uh, mirrors the type of standards that, that NIOSH respirators um, rate down to. And so we, we um, tested this at two flow rates because uh, again, NIOSH standards are very, very strict and they use a flow rate that represents heavy breathing. Like if you just went up a flight of stairs or you had to, you're, you're doing labor intensive work. Um, however, most people, if you're just walking around the supermarket um, or even sitting um, indoors, uh, the breathing rate is, is a lot, is a little bit less. And that actually means the filter is more effective because you're, yeah, you're not passing as much air through it. Um, and so we did our testing at, uh, at two different rates. And um, if you wanna read more about all of the details of the test, which I won't go into, um, then we do have this white paper available that publishes all the, uh, that has all the results in the test methodology um, and a little bit more about um, how, how this matches up to standards. And that's available online on our, our website. And there's a link down here as well. Um, I'll show a few other test results before I wrap up. Um, so, so 
And what I showed before was like the, the pretty marketing simplified graph. But if you want to see the full range of particles that we tested, um, this was the normal breathing rate. And we, we went all the way down to 10 nanometers. Um, and like uh, Neil touched on, there's this like sweet spot along the, the size as you go down in size where the particles actually have an easier time penetrating because they're small. But then as you get smaller and smaller and smaller um, towards 10 nanometers, they start behaving more like a gas um, and they kind of just diffuse. Um, and it, as, as a result, don't necessarily, it, like the filter is almost like it's not, they, they behave more like a gas essentially. And so they don't, they don't get trapped by the filter. They can come and go as, as they like, and they adhere to different principles of, of physics and particles that have a certain size of mass at the other end of the spectrum. Um, and so we have all these graphs for the heavy reading rate as well in our filter white paper. But um, as I, I touched on with the three layer and the four layer filters that we offer, um, there's also the question of over time as you use it, does it still work as well? And so we did this test with our, our four layer filter um, where we, we ran this particle, the, the same sodium chloride test at different time um, or rather, sorry, we, we bombarded them over time with um, sodium chloride particles and then measured the filtration efficiency at different time points, uh, which doesn't represent real time. So this isn't after like 10 or 40 minutes of wearing it. It's, uh, it's actually really hard to correlate that with real wearing time, but this is just the time of the particle bombardment in the test chamber. And so the green line down at the bottom is um, that's the lowest uh, performing efficient uh, filtration efficiency. And see, uh, as we go, it actually becomes, becomes more efficient in terms of filtering particles, but that's also, that's because it's getting clogged with particles. So um, the, your, your filter might not work as well for other reasons uh, over time, but it's not, not because it, um, not because the filtration efficiency went down. And so I'll leave that about our, I'll leave it at that with our filter testing. Um, and yeah, you can read all the details on our, in our white paper on our website. Um, but I'll just close talking about our company a little bit more and our, you know, our startup story. Um, yeah, so the, the value prop in our, uh, with our mask is not just that it has um, highly efficient filters um, and, and a well forming seal. Um, there's, you know, we, we're, we're actually a public benefit corporation and we have a social mission to our company, which uh, we're still building out as we're quite new, but um, we, we have a mission to reduce waste. So most of this mask is reusable and washable. Um, over time, and uh, we're looking at ways to improve the um, the environmental or reduce the footprint of our packaging and other ways that we run our business. Um, and we're hoping to appeal to the general public by having different dials and um, the, this fabric overlay um, is quite easy to you know make make different versions of it. So hopefully we can appeal to a wide range of people in use cases. Um, with that, and and we really look at this not just as a, a filtration science problem. Um, you know, this is a, a whole human art. We we really take into account our users as as whole people and how this might fit into their lifestyle um, and other other things that uh, that are on people's mind right now during the pandemic and how. So we we have a blog as well, um, trying to sift through some of the, uh, you know, all of the noise and help um, answer questions and simplify things for people where we can so that they feel, um, feel safe. And um, also working on our, the impact side of our business, um, something we'd like to start doing um, really soon with, once we find the right partners is donate a certain portion of masks to, to place community small communities where it will make a 
a large difference, whether it's in people who can't access proper uh, PPE or respiratory protection for other reasons. Um, and, um, and so we're, that, that's part of our, something we're working on now is how to identify where we can have the most impact by donating um, masks to people who um, don't have the right access, but who, who really need respiratory protection. Um, and uh, something that really, really exciting that uh, is going to be, I think, make a big difference for our business that happened um, this week is uh, we, we are featured in Time's Best Inventions of 2020 this year. And so already we've seen like this is opening all kinds of doors for us um, in terms of partnerships and um, making connections with research organizations and, um, you know, other other large uh, partners who we wouldn't have otherwise, you know, wouldn't have returned our calls. But uh, so this is really exciting. And this is another I think is going to be another inflection point in our journey of uh, I've been with the company eight months. I think that's we haven't been around more, much more than a year. So this is really exciting. And, um, and so we're on the lookout now um, for, for raising our first round of funding um, and also really on the impact side, looking for um, organizations that we can, uh, that we can partner with to make sure that we, we're not just donating masks. We, we wanna make sure that we're having measurable and meaningful impact. Um, and if we can partner with um, research um, institutions, uh, that's something we're definitely interested in using um, either from the filtration science or public health um, side of things. And um, yeah, a few new, new teammates with various expertise, um, both on the engineering side and on the, the business and the social impact business side. So, you know, and, and anyone uh, can give me my email is also in, in this deck and uh, you can get in touch with us in a lot of different ways. Uh, but yeah, feel free to shoot me an email. And I think Marin, um, yeah, if, um, if, if you are interested in a mask, um, then if there's enough people, we can offer our, our bulk pricing. Um, if not, we'll figure out a different kind of a deal for everyone to, to order a mask. Um, yeah. well, thanks a lot for having me. And um, I wasn't reading the questions super carefully while I was talking, but happy right. to answer well, questions. We weren't supposed to have to do that. So I was keeping on top of them. Uh, one person asked about the propensity for most masks to cause your glasses to fog up. And that was, um, uh, and I can just answer that from personal experience, that actually is, this mask, it, there's only one size of it so far, and it fits me as long as I adjust it right. And sometimes it might slip, but the way I'll know that it's slipping is that it'll tickle, the little air will come out and tickle me in my eyes. And if it, if it were maladjusted that way, then it would steam up the glasses, but if you're um, if it is adjusted perfectly, all the breath is going out the front filters and not up by your eyes. And so it doesn't steam up the glasses if it's adjusted right. It is a little bulky, so depending on your glasses, there might be a little glasses interference. Um, yeah. So, and in terms of the discount, if people, if there's a whole lot of people locally, we could do something with bulk, but I think, Allison, you said that you could just have a sort of sustainability salon coupon code. Some of the people here are from far away. Yeah. And, um, uh, but, you know, if people wanted to work with, basically, probably the thing to do is to contact me. Just email me perhaps with salon and mask, salon mask in the subject line, and then we can see what to do going forward. Um, and it may be, I just tell you, order it with, uh, and, and you said you could set up a coupon code that was just sustainability salon. Yeah. 
Yeah, you can share that, you know, if, if it makes sense to go that way instead of the bulk order, we can, we'll just yeah. put that code for you. Yeah, and the bulk order would be a question of dealing with payment and I don't know what I would do with a giant Venmo balance. <laughs> but, um, I mean, yeah. I'd be happy, I'm always happy to see people for a nice safe contact, <laughs> low contact pass, pass along. Uh, but it depends on how many people locally would like them, whether that will make any more sense. Um, in terms of fit, there's a, on their website, there's a thing you measure from the tip of your nose to the tip of your chin, and there's a certain measurement for which it's likely to work. Yeah. Allison, yeah. You? One thing we definitely learned um, through our, our crowdfunding is this, this mask is it's best for, for smaller faces, smaller adult faces. So we're working on a larger side, size um, really, really soon, um, really early, early next year. And then the children's size is also something that we saw demand for. So yeah, it, it's just, uh, yeah, it's a matter of time for designing the, the geometry and then having enough money uh, available for the tooling and all the fun things of being a, a new business who, who doesn't already have a huge operating budget. Um, uh, yeah, so if, if there is, it's not something that they can take back. So what I have done locally, yeah. um, I made them available to a couple of other people so far and I had them just try mine on when I hadn't worn it for a few days which will work locally. So if you want to do that, what we can do is say like within the next week, we'll try to get all this sorted out. So email me quickly with salon and mask in the subject line. And if you want to, if you are local and want to just try it on, um, you can use one of ours that we haven't worn for a few days, which as we know, this virus is fairly tender and won't live on it. And we're also a very careful and symptom free household and, um uh so that that's for local uh for far away thaddeus i um wondering about the uh you know if there's anyone else in your family that you could pass it along to if it turns out not to work but i would start with that measurement and see how you compare to it and i see hello claire good to see you <laughs> Um, and uh, uh, Mar Meg, Margaret, be sure to email me with salon mask in the subject line. Erin asked about caustic vapor filtration. I think this is mainly particles and not vapors. Am I correct? Yes. Yeah, that's, that's a really good point. Um, so yeah, vapors or anything that like things you can smell, for example, wouldn't be filtered because they're actually a lot smaller um, mm -hmm. than 0.1 microns. So um, that's definitely something we want to uh, research, you know, filters that have activated carbon um, that can adsor absorb gases uh, are good for that. And that's, that's something we want to research uh, once we have the, the time and um, I guess budget for that. Mm -hmm. Maren, I have a question. Yes. Claire here. Um, oh. Recently, yeah. I vis visited the hospital wearing a uh, commercial mask that had a small filter on one side. And I was stopped by the security at the entrance and asked to please wear over it a non-woven surgical mask because this filter uh, was considered not, not to be as safe as a regular cloth mask. This also happened to me when I was on an airline flight uh, they gave me a, a replacement mask so that it did not have a filter. So I am wondering if um, Allison could talk about that. Well, I'm suspecting that, the, which I did respond in the comments, there are masks that have a little dubah here. A valve. The dubah valve. is a valve. a valve. And I have some that I've had for, for woodworking because when you're woodworking, you only care, you want to clean the air going in and you don't care about the air going out. So uh, if it was a filter, but it looked like one of the ones with a valve, or if it was a valve, that's yeah. why they would want that additional protection. Because, uh, I mean, this mask is way better than a surgical mask. 
just okay. way, 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 way better. Okay, better. well, yeah. I appreciate that. I didn't see it in the, in the response, so thank you. Oh, yeah, I, I'm pretty sure I put that down. I, I will say, though, um, we have had um, of comments, just because of the look of our, mm -hmm. our mask with the circles, um, yeah. they do appear as though they are valves, even though they're not valves. Um, and so we are, we're designing a, a fabric overlay that's opaque. Yeah. Um, so that pe people have gotten stopped actually going, going shopping at, mm -hmm. or at Disneyland or getting on flights and being told to wear a different mask mm -hmm. because of the perception of, of valves. Yeah, the fabric overlay, I also should give credit where credit is due, was designed by my cousin, my second cousin once removed. Um, and it's separate, you can take it apart from the other part of the mask and that's how you get at these filter thingies and these little thumb covers, I'll just take it off and that's how the filter goes in and out. Um, and uh, my, co my cousin's daughter was, uh, she did textile design at the University of Minnesota and then later her, I think one of her first jobs was working at NASA doing wearable technology. So she's really good with all kinds of textile things. So she designed this fabric overlay and um, it's, it's a Velcro and I, me putting something Velcro in the back of my hair would be terrible, terrible, but this is a super fine Velcro that doesn't snag my hair. And then it has this other elastic because it's got all these different parts. And it, it, one thing that could improve is, is how well it stays on because a couple times it's fallen out, not when it's on, but um, that's, uh, I think I saw someone else comment that on the website, um, that it, there's like little hooks on the, the plastic part that hold, that are like little flanges that go into little slots in the cloth. So they're working on opaque ones and other colors, and it's probably a lot easier to do that, uh, to make those changes than change the size for a whole different structure of face. Uh, but I know there's a lot of people who are eager to have that improvement. Uh, yeah, those are basically have, two different. Uh, yeah. Yeah, those are they're two different uh, dreams that we're working on right now. Right. Um, and so you may see more colors before you see um, a new size because it's a lot easier to tool up for it is. a different fabric than to uh, yeah. change the whole structure of the thing. But it's really, it's super well designed. It's got this soft seal and it's, so it's, if you had one of those N95 uh, respirators that are meant to be well sealed in a hospital, you, it will be very uncomfortable because it has to be held so tight because the edge is just basically a line. But here the edge is this soft surface. Um, another thing that someone was mentioning about the um, uh, the steaming up of your glasses that won't happen when this is well sealed, it does build up moisture inside because you still, your breath is very moist and it's gonna condense on whatever it hits, whether it's your glasses or the inside of the mask is cooler than your insides. Um, and it, it can get quite a bit, but again, because of this structure, it's not like your face is in the wet there's a place where that can slosh around. And if my uh, one cousin who may be on here is a preschool teacher, a 60 year old preschool teacher, she wears this all day, every day. And she, I don't know if she has started to take it off to dump it out, but I, I just take it and I take a, uh, that causes a, quite a bit of moisture sloshing around, but I just went to the co-op this morning, to the food co-op, and there was a little moisture in there. And so rather than just let it dry in place, I did take and swab it out with a cloth. So I've just, if I have it on for long enough for any significant amount of moisture, um, I just swab it out. And I'm, that's one of the few things I will use a microfiber cloth for because it works so well. Um, and people are asking about the cost and the basic, um, Basic cost is 60 bucks and then $10 shipping. And so you were uh, talking about a, um, 
And then for if you're ordering multiples for your family or friends, wherever you are, uh, the cost would go down a bit. And you, uh, Allison, I think you guys said that you would offer a $10 yeah. discount, which would basically pay yeah. for the shipping uh, if you're just getting a single mask. Yeah, exactly. And then the filters are, um, it's $8.99 for five filter changes of the before layer filters and then $7.99 for five, five oh. filter changes. So uh, cost went down. That's five pairs. Yeah. So this pairs is of filters. Yeah. So you get five of, of, of these sets of two. And most of their packaging is, is cardboard. So it's pretty, um, it's, it's, there's a, there's a few things have like the mask itself has a plastic bag around it, I think when it comes, but, but the box is all just plain brown cardboard. And so you can compost that, you can recycle that and not feel too terribly guilty yeah. about inflicting the, on the world. Uh, there's a question about the sol a solid overlay affecting the breathability um, as well. And yeah, the, the breathability of the overlay is really important because we don't want to add any extra. Uh, it doesn't filter anything. It's, it's yeah. We want it to be opaque so that people don't confuse uh, the filters yeah. with valves, but uh, want to make it as breathable as possible. Mm -hmm. So something cool, the next overlay we're going to release is actually going to be a knitted construction. Hmm. Um, and then it's cool, you can change the texture and the knit pattern around where the filters are so that it, there's just a lot more um, large holes and it's open and breathable as the, mm -hmm. the rest of it can be a little bit more, like give it some more structure and the whole thing is still opaque, but it's really breathable. Mm -hmm. Okay. Definitely. Cool. So everybody should email me with mask and uh, salon and mask in the subject line. And then I will, um, uh, I may just say, just order it on site on the line on, on site, or we can work out a bulk order and I'll be in touch with Allison and we'll try to get that all figured out within the week. Okay, Does that work for everybody. Let me check the chat. Um, oh, how long do we think this might be needed? Things getting back to normal. Well, uh, there are a couple of vaccines that are in the offing, but think about how long it's going to take for them, for everybody to get the vaccine, especially when something like half the people are uh, not believing in masks or are anti-vaxxers. So I don't, th I think this is going to be our new normal for quite a while. Mm -hmm. Anybody? And then there's seasonal things like fire, like wildfires. Uh-huh that will happen every year. Yeah, and here in Pittsburgh, I know relatively few people who routinely wear masks because of the pollution here, but I do know a few people who do routinely wear masks. Um, Kathleen is on here, and uh, uh, Mark Dixon, who couldn't be here today, he just as Max, the founder of Breathe 99, um, you know, out running, he was doing it in Singapore. Well, Mark does it in Pittsburgh and he would often do it with a mask because he felt that it was compromising his health to, to breathe the air while running. So, um, that is, uh, um, and, and in other places like in China, they wear masks all the time, either. They yeah. also have masks. If they're sick, they wear a mask. If the air is particularly bad, which it is a lot of the time, they wear a mask. So people in other countries are used to wearing masks. It's just Americans aren't used to it yet. Yeah. Yeah, that's what Max found. He did research in, uh, like in Singapore and Korea. Um, and it's just a social norm to wear a mask when you're sick. It, it's a courtesy. Mm -hmm. It's not like here where, you know, you, you feel like you people will think you're, you're strange or um, mm -hmm. it's very normal over there. So that would be cool if that became a social norm and probably a lot better for public health. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
so I think, um, thank you so much, Allison, for dialing in from Montreal. And, uh, and I don't know if my cousin Julia has made it on the call. She was maybe going to join us. Or my daughter, Keelan, who made all these other cool masks, which some of them seal better than others. And if I'm outside, I might use one of these cloth masks instead. Um, but now that I have the Breathe 99, if I'm going inside anywhere, that's the one I use. It's my go-to for feeling safe and being safe. So. Well, thanks, Marin. Yeah. And, and everyone and for listening. Free to stay on. We have lots of other interesting science happening. Um, starting with uh, Professor Edson Severnini at Carnegie Mellon. Before I, for a while there, it seemed like I had all kinds of CMU stuff. So we did branch out. We got Minnesota, Canada stuff, and we got Pitt slash Alaska stuff. <laughs> uh, Bernie Goldstein has just moved to Anchorage, but he'll be dialing in from there. Um, and uh, so Edson is part of a uh, research team that did a retrospective study of how uh, air, regional air pollution in different places correlated with uh, death rates in the 1918 pandemic and how they, so I'm very interested to hear how they unfolded that from the First World War or the big war or the war to end all wars didn't work much, very well did it, um, uh, around the globe. Uh, so this will also be a window into that pandemic because I can, here we are, we're in a pandemic, a global pandemic, and there've been some near misses with, with SARS and Ebola and, uh, other, other pandemics that didn't quite sweep the world the way this one, the way COVID-19 has. Um, and in the places where those pandemics were happening, there was certainly, um, I'm sure that life was, was altered. Um, there was, uh, you know, people were wearing masks and businesses were shutting down and everything was changing and transportation and food and everything else. So, um, and many of those places were not, uh, like we are here. So looking either to other developing countries that might have had Ebola or whatever, or looking back 102 years to 1918 when there was no Zoom, there was no internet, there was no, um, not even, there was no television, there was maybe, I mean, I don't think that radio had really started broadcasting. Um, and there, I think there were telephones, but they weren't very widespread. So people, you, if you feel cut off in your house, but you've got Netflix and you can order stuff that you want on online or have your grocery store deliver, um, just imagine what life must have been like in 1918. So I'm sort of hoping that uh, Part of uh, Edson's talk will will bring that all home, and and some of us are in much better shape than others. Those of us with jobs, those of us who can work at home and feel safe, and that's primarily along an educational divide, where people that don't have um, uh, a higher good education are doing the jobs that you can't do from home or that are not happening. Service jobs or other, whether it's service jobs that aren't happening or construction jobs or other jobs that you have to go to with other people and you aren't as safe as those of us who have the ability to stay home. So, um, so just think about that. And while this, this whole pandemic is a big pain in the butt, um, it's a real hardship for some people more than others. And, um, and just imagine what it was like in 19. So now to take us back to 1918, we will, uh, 
can add some Severini's video and see what he has to say. I think you can share slides as you need. Yes. And thank you so much for joining us. Yeah, thanks, Mary, for the invitation. This is uh, super interesting. Um, and I'm sorry for joining a little bit late. Well, uh, I was presenting another here. conference before coming here. <laughs> Thank you for taking us in. <laughs> yeah, so this, this was, um, it's still an ongoing work about pandemics, pollution, and healthcare, access to healthcare. Uh, but the study that I'm going to share with you uh, today is the one. Uh, the first one that we published on this topic that uh, talks about the interactions of pollution and infectious disease in the context of the 1918 influenza pandemic. So this is joint work with my colleague Karen Clay and my co-author uh, Josh, Josh, Josh Lewis from the University of Montreal. So as you are aware, uh, there are lots of people um, dying around the world because of exposure to pollution. So uh, this old now estimate from the WHO uh, in 2009 shows that about 1.3 million uh, people were dying directly from exposure uh, to very high levels of air pollution. Um, infectious disease, on the other hand, is responsible for about 23% uh, of the global deaths. Uh, so these are two problems and they are uh, potentially in some uh, circles uh, treated as independently uh, when you're policymakers are designing some policies to tackle each one of them. They do it separately. But there's a small but growing, uh, you know, interest in analyzing how these two factors or two sources of exposure uh, interact and, um, and how that affects um, both pollution policy and also preparation for pandemics. There are many empirical challenges of understanding this uh, um, relationship. Ideally, uh, we would like to run an experiment, which is, of course, unethical, uh, to put people uh, in, in different chambers with different uh, levels of pollution and then trying to see how they are, you know, they are affected by the virus, which is exactly what researchers have done for mice. Of course, we're not going to do this for humans. Uh, now, the 1918 uh, pandemic is going to be a very interesting setting to um, mimic some aspects, but not others, of this uh, hypothetical uh, experiment. So health shocks are not common uh, in, in terms of the um, a flu. Um, there is always this antigenic drift, so vir virus strains evolve. So um, you know, when you're analyzing uh, the effects of one particular virus it, in a particular season, it might be different from the other season. Uh, also, it, uh, depends, uh, it depends on prior exposure. So if, if there is, uh, you know, the same uh, viral and it's just evolution of that virus, maybe, uh, you know, if you were exposed to one of those viruses before, it might help. Um, also, pollution is not randomly assigned. So it's typically correlated with a number of uh, other determinants of disease transmission. Uh, for example, uh, access to medical services or just preferences for health. Some, some, some families, some people are more, uh, you know, cautious, uh, others are not. Uh, and also your resources, uh, your income. Um, so in order to uh, get these effects, we would like to uh, interact these two, um, you know, factors, large health shocks that are completely new and uh, differences in exposure to air pollution. Um, the, the Spanish influenza pandemic of 1918 um, is, uh, you know, uh, it spreads widely and rapidly uh, around the country. And uh, medical uh, interventions uh, are viewed now as uh, broadly ineffective. There are some exceptions, of course. Uh, and there was limited scope for viral evolution. There was actually an antigenic shift. It was a new virus strain. Uh, and that was uh, basically meaning that uh, the population at large uh, was um, lacking immunity. But there were large unexplained differences in pandemic-related mortality. So for example, uh, in, in Pennsylvania, there was about uh, 6.9 um, deaths per thousand people. Um, in Ohio, which is a neighboring state, it was 3.3. So you can see that there was a lot of differences. Um, also, even within the same state, uh, in Missouri, for example, Kansas City was 5.5 um, per thousand, 
uh, and in St. Louis it was 3.5 per thousand. So, um, you know, there were a lot of heterogeneity in, in pandemic related mortality. And urban air pollution was severe and varied widely across cities. I'll give you some measurements, historical measurements, just for you to have a sense of, you know, where they were and where we are now. So this, this, in this study, we are going to be looking at this, uh, you know, uh, uh, two, in, two phenomena, two causes of, mort uh, of potential mortality, um, the exposure to the pandemic, the exposure to air pollution, and we digitized uh, data from uh, a 180 U.S. cities from 1915 to 1925. And also, uh, we got a snapshot of the coal capacity, coal uh, fired electricity generation capacity uh, in 1915 as uh, a measure of uh, exposure to air pollution across cities. So just to give a little more details on the pandemic, uh, the uh, pandemic w uh, broke out in three waves of, uh, between March 1918 until April 1919. Some people uh, always say September uh, to September of 1918 to uh, March or April of 1919, just because the, the deadliest um, wave was the second one. Uh, and it originated in Camp uh, or Fort Devens uh, near Boston uh, and uh, was initially spreading, uh, you know, where the military was actually uh, taking people. Um, and then it diffused nationwide uh, between early September and October. You might be familiar with this graph. Uh, we just took the data again and replicated. So you can see uh, the dashed line uh, at the bottom of the figure. Uh, it shows the mortality per thousand or influenza. Uh, that's per, per 100,000 people in, uh, on average between 1913 and 17, uh, which is here the baseline for us. And then this solid line shows us the uh, mortality uh, for the 1918-1919 for the pandemic. So you can see that it reached levels, uh, you know, super high, like it's uh, almost 250 um, uh, influenza deaths per 100,000 people, just to compare. Nowadays, I was checking the highest levels that we got for the COVID pandemic in the US. Like I, I checked today in the state of North Dakota, it was in the past seven days, it was 176 uh, deaths per 100,000 people. So it, we are still like around here, like it, it was even worse, but here it was widespread. It was not only concentrated in one particular location. Now, uh, it led to uh, the estimates go from 675 to 850,000 people uh, dying in the U.S. Uh, the case fatality rate was uh, over 2.5 percent, so meaning the number of people, the proportion of people dying among those who were infected was, uh, you know, very high compared to below 0.1 percent in, in other influenza pandemics. So the U.S. had other pandemics in the, in the 50s and 60s, and I'll talk about that uh, at the end. Uh, the unique feature of this pandemic was this age distribution that was almost like a W. Uh, so in general, the pandemics uh, hit the young and the elderly more often and higher rates, but this one actually affected even in the middle. And there's so many hypotheses for why that happens, which one of them uh, is actually similar to what people are talking about now for COVID, which they say it's the... Um, a strong reaction of a very uh, strong immune system that overwhelms the, uh, the rest of the, uh, the, the, the body. The, there's multiple organ uh, failure if that happens. Um, and, uh, you know, in the pandemic, mortality was often the result of a secondary infection with bacterial pneumonia. So when I say influenza deaths, I, I refer to, you know, a broad category that could potentially include uh, the bacterial pneumonia, which was, you know, after they got infected. Um, uh, because the data at the time was not super well, uh, you know, categorizing the, uh, the, the cause of death. Uh, the, the public health response, the public health response uh, is now uh, viewed as ineffective, like there were no uh, treatments available and the preventative measures uh, were uh, many times inadequate or adopted too late, like, uh, you know, the famous case of uh, Philly adopting, uh, you know, uh, lockdowns really late. Uh, and the public response was uh, hampered by, as Mary uh, mentioned, the, the war effort. So there's also like the movement of person, military personnel around the country and, uh, uh, and also, you know, uh, people working in different activities going around to help with the, the war effort. Um, 
Now, that's about the pandemic. Pollution, it's not, I, need, I don't need to remind you of the historical uh, levels of pollution in Pittsburgh. I just put a picture here, but it was not only Pittsburgh, the, like St. Louis, for example, was also a very polluting uh, a city. Uh, I just wanted to provide some measurements here of uh, TSP, the total suspended particulate, particulate uh, at the time, like not at the time, but like uh, a few years later, just to have a sense of where we were in terms of pollution. There was one measurement in Chicago in 1912, in the winter uh, in 1912, uh, and it was uh, about 760 um, uh, micrograms per cubic meter. So uh, just to give a sense, like when the Cleaner Act was enacted in 1970s, the, um, uh, the uh, standard for TSP, the maximum that you, 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 they put as a standard was 150. So we were way, way ahead uh, of that. And then in 1931, uh, also in the winter, they made some measurements in, a, in, the, in 14 uh, large cities in the US, and you can see here Pittsburgh, uh, you know, and St. Louis, the pictures that I showed you, uh, to be among these very high levels of pollution, uh, and TSP, uh, 630 micrograms per cubic meter. And, and then other cities were lower levels, but you know, uh, even though it's like in the group of Los Angeles, Detroit, San Francisco and Washington was, you know, 350, it's still very high to the average that we had in the 1990, which was 60. So you can see that that's very different. And just to compare worldwide, in, in, in the 80s, uh, early 90s, uh, 58 Chinese cities uh, had uh, around fi 538. So it was like pretty comparable to 1931 in the largest cities uh, in, in the US. Okay. Now, uh, why coal-fired power plants? Uh, well, they accounted for 20% of the domestic coal consumption in 1920. It was not the largest uh, use of coal, um, but it is an important one. Uh, and most of the plants were in urban areas and the pollution was emitted, uh, you know, and dis dispersed very locally. Most of the stacks, the smokestacks were relatively short, so they were below 100 meters. In the 70s, it reached 400 meters just for comparison, so it was still very, very low at the time. Uh, in, in, 19, in, the, in the 1990s, there was a study in Illinois that showed that most 40% uh, over 40% of the particulate matter fall within 30 miles. This considering this very, very high, very tall smokestack, so it, it was even more locally dispersed uh, in, historically. And in terms of the, uh, the the relationship between air pollution and influenza, there there were lots of correlational studies looking at kids uh, with influenza influenza coming from different areas with different levels of air pollution. There were the randomized studies with mice that basically put them in chambers with different levels of TSP and then uh, you know, uh, exposed them to the influenza viruses and showed that it was much more severe in those who had uh, been exposed to higher levels of um, uh, particulate matter. And there are some microbiology uh, studies as well looking at how the cells work and it, it, they showed that uh, particulate matter exposure enhances susceptibility to influenza fun, uh, infection, and uh, you know um, it reduces the response to bacterial infection uh, in the lungs. So just going into the study uh, quickly, I just put one table here that like cells. Uh, more, more or less the, the story that we have. So what we're looking is uh, infant mortality or all age mortality. And we are understanding, we are interacting uh, each year that we have in the data with a measure of co-capacity. And we divide the cities, the 180 city, uh, cities in the sample into three terciles, um, uh, low, medium, and high uh, co-capacity. And then we are comparing here medium co-capacity relative to low or high versus low. And so if you see that these uh, you know, coefficients here are, are significant, it tells us that with the stars here, it tells, the, tells us that uh, you know, there were 6.5% um, uh, more deaths, for example, in, uh, in uh, uh, it, sorry, the, the infant mortality rate uh, was 6.5% higher in places with medium coca capacity relative to local capacity and 8.20 uh, of places that had high coca capacity versus local capacity. We like better the third column just because we are controlling for a number of other features in terms of economic, demographics, and even uh, geographic uh, features. Trends based on our baseline mortality, basically trying to control for a number of unobservables uh, in the analysis. And we still show that, you know, it has the pattern that you expected that increased mortality, um, uh, both for kids and for, um, you know, you know, every, every 
everybody in the population, and it, 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 in, it increased mortality even more for the places with very high uh, coal capacity. Now, uh, this, uh, you know, this, the, the pandemic was responsible, um, you know, the excess mortality in 1918 uh, for these cities was about 158,000 uh, people, um, about 52 people per, per, per 10,000 uh, people. And we are showing here that if we were to bring coal capacity from these high levels to the low levels, which are the two types of cities in our, in our sample, we would have uh, you know, averted about 35,000 uh, deaths uh, in high coal cities or uh, about 7,000 deaths in the medium coal cities relative to the coal. So again, it's a counterfactual experiment, a hypothetical. If we could take the uh, electricity generation from coal-fired plants to other sources, and the other sources here would be pretty much hydro dam at the time. Uh, and uh, the same, we, we do this in two approaches. One is more conservative than the other. So it's about 30 to 40, uh, 1, 42,000 people dying uh, that could be averted if we could pot potentially generate, it, uh, generate electricity using other sources or reduce electricity consumption at that moment. Now, there are other determinants of the pandemic. So, uh, you know, um, uh, some people have talked about the proximity to uh, the, the military bases in the US. So we, we control for that. We got data from the War Department exactly uh, where they were and, you know, uh, the distance for, for the cities. And some other people were saying, well, baseline health also matters. And as Marin said, like the education levels might matter. So we did a comparison here just to see other factors relative to what we we're finding. So, Naturally, uh, infant mortality here is measured at the baseline, which is a reflection of the health condition in those cities to start with. So if the health condition was poorer, like this blue line here is when cities had a higher level of infant mortality in the baseline relative to the low mortality cities, they were also, the excess mortality was much higher. Um, and, and middles and medium uh, cities, cities with uh, infant mortality, uh, is still above the cities with low infant mortality in the baseline, also had an excess mortality that was uh, very important, but also education mattered. So you can see here that uh, if the proportion of illiterates in the population was also very high, the uh, excess mortality was also uh, quite high, comparable to the uh, baseline health conditions. And coal for electricity generation is just one component. Now, we are using for electricity generation, there might be other sources, manufacturing, for example. So it, it could be that this uh, a coal usage was very important. This is just for the, the electricity generation. Uh, and then the proximity to where war bases was also important. Exposure, exposure to where the, uh, the, uh, the virus was spreading was important. Now, uh, this is a very, uh, you know, uh, um, um, descriptive work and so people would say okay now we know that the factors are, are, are very importantly correlated uh, to the, um, uh, the severity of the pandemic correlated with air pollution is there anything we could, we could do that we could have done differently or is there anything that we can do if there's another pandemic uh, so so how do we go about uh, preparing for those pandemics and so we actually explored a little bit this this idea uh, looking at the other flu pandemics in the US that happened in 5758, it's called the Asian flu pandemic, and then 6869, the Hong Kong flu pandemic. And why we look at these two? Because they're less severe than the 1918, so it's about 100,000 people dying in each of these two pandemics. Um, but in between them, there was the implementation of Medicare and Medicaid. And so here we're gonna be looking only for kids wh which benefited from, from Medicaid. Um, and uh, there was a Medicaid was implemented in a way that if if the family was already eligible for some other welfare programs, especially the AFDC, uh, you know it, they would benefit automatically from Medicaid. So they were covered by Medicaid right away. Uh, and and there was a lot of geographical uh, variation across states uh, and uh, on this eligibility, and of course across uh, uh, counties and cities uh, in terms of air pollution as well. And what we see is that the coal capacity, uh, you know, who, which was affecting the severity, again, of the, the 57, 58, and 68, 69, 
you know, before the Medicaid expansion happened, nothing is offset. The effect of the, the 6% increase in the infant mortality rate is not offset by access to medical care because these people are not, they're not covered yet. There is no Medicaid yet. Once Medicaid was passed and then people uh, were benefiting from it, look at here in this evidence in the last column, it basically offsets all the effect. So, and we explored in the paper why that might be the case and we realized that that was pretty much for kids that were uh, needed treatment in the first day of, 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 of life. So it, it reduced mortality in the first day of life tremendously uh, having access to medical care. And we showed that there was also, um, you know, a spillover effect. So people who were not covered but lived close to the people covered also benefited from not having, you know, uh, the, the, the flu at the time. So just to conclude quickly, uh, I think I'm already uh, over time here. Uh, so just to conclude, the pollution, uh, air pollution in high and medium coke cities was, was responsible for about 30 to 42,000 additional deaths, uh, and that was 19 to 26% of the total pandemic mortality in those cities. Uh, and so ignoring the interaction between pollution and the flu uh, or any infectious disease might underestimate the, uh, the true health cost of air pollution. Uh, but also, it, it's important to remember that uh, improved uh, access to healthcare helped to mitigate the consequences. And as I said, it was pretty much improving uh, prenatal uh, health. Uh, so, uh, some recommendations now uh, in terms of you know what we should do. Like you know, it it should bring some lessons for us to plan for other pandemics and also to uh, enact some uh, uh, air quality related policies. So despite, despite major advances in medical care, like a pandemic of similar uh, you know, scope could overwhelm the system. We are seeing this right now. Uh, but we also could use preventative approaches that would abate pollution, uh, especially in those times. Uh, and of course, vaccination. It was not available in 1918, but it was already available in 1960s. Uh, 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 and we are seeing now the importance of vaccine as well. Uh, but also, it's important to remember that it, it's important to provide medical uh, assistance and allowing people to be insured or having access to, uh, to, 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 to medical care uh, during these this times because it, it becomes very, very important and could offset the effects of the pandemic. In terms of the pollution, I, I just plotted here uh, these uh, levels of pollution in Allegheny County. And uh, you know, I don't know if you can see very well, but the the the, the light uh, gray uh, line here uh, shows the um, the average for the five years, uh, the last five years in terms of particulate matter or ozone, and the blue is the one that we are facing now in 2020. And you can see that, like you know, we had some spikes in pollution. So uh, the 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 uh, bluish area that is shading, it's if the, it's the highest that we had for that day historically in the past 20 years, and the lowest. So you can see here, for example, in November, we had one day that was almost hitting the maximum we we, we had in the past 20 years. And so ozone has reached levels that we haven't observed in the past 20 years. So I think one one message is that we have to be uh, even more careful and. And, and, and advocate for measures that would, you know, drop these levels of pollution, especially during the pandemic. I will stop here. Thank you. And thanks, Mary, for the invitation. And I'm open, you know, for questions. Um. Thank you so much, Edson. Uh, it's clear that with enough of a retrospective view, one can tease out, tease out uh, the influence of things like um, air pollution, the influence of air pollution. And it's, it's really great to see how careful you guys were at um, eliminating other other possible factors like healthcare and such. Um, and um, in the comments, we have people talking about uh, relations who died in the 1918 pandemic. And, and I also have that there's a, my grandmother's cousin, um, Norman Clausen, uh, was a, in World War I and he, came back 
and while he was sort of in whatever place they collect them, getting ready to send everybody home, um, died of the flu. And, you know, after being through all that and surviving some very harrowing wartime experiences, he died with his lungs filling, filling with fluid, which is not a good way to go. Um, uh, Margaret asks whether you shared this presentation with anyone in uh, Pittsburgh government in, or Allegheny County in particular, which has sway over health, uh, over uh, air quality here. Yeah, my colleague Karen Clay has. Uh, I don't remember like exactly which uh, portion of the, I think it was the health department uh, that she shared with. I talked about a little bit with the I think it's called sustainability group, like in the city government uh, about this. The resilience? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Um, uh, so, um, and we've, we've been talking also like with, you know, not only the, uh, the local government, like the city, but also the state, uh, uh, especially in terms of, you know, access to medical care and even like other states where <laughs> Medicaid is still not <laughs> expanded after uh, the Affordable Care Act. And, and that's super important now during the pandemic. So, um, and, and the, 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 the study was also uh, shared like, uh, you know, for, you know, many other groups through uh, the NBR and uh, interviews with uh, reporters, like to, to make sure that people uh, were getting the information. Um, I noticed that, especially for the Medicaid one, there was a lot of discussion uh, uh, in the current pandemic because you know some states were not uh, hadn't expanded yet. So, um, and then showing that this was actually mattering, especially I didn't go into the details, but uh, uh, one factor that was um, similar to the pandemic now, uh, now and and back then was the uh, uh, percentage of. Um, of immigrants in cities, and that that actually mattered. Uh, and you know, having uh, you know uh, immigrants now also covered at least for the pandemic would could be important for the. I think part of the story is like even people who were not benefiting from Medicaid in the sixties benefited because they were not exposed to uh, the pandemic from the people who hadn't covered and then had covered uh, through Medicaid um, coverage through Medicaid. So. Uh, let's see. Yeah, the um, federally funded center, health care centers are, family health centers are usually located in poorer communities. Um, yeah, the, the community centers, like they have been shown to affect, uh, uh, you know, um, adult health not more than for kids. So uh, okay. in, in that sense, it could be important for other uh, age groups. Um, because for, for kids, like the uh, um, Medicaid was uh, really covering, covering and pretty much like every kid that was not covered uh, in those, in those mm -hmm. decades. Uh -huh. But for adults, it was not the case. So um, I think there was a question uh, in the chat about, do you have oh, a hypothesis? The mechanism. Yeah, on the, for the mechanism of air pollution uh, effect. So in the microbiology studies, uh, they, basically, they basically look at how the cell uh, functions uh, when exposed to uh, air pollution. So I'm not like a microbiology person, so I can just tell you like what the literature says. It basically tells us that it, it weakens uh, the response. So if you're exposed to, you have been exposed to pollution and you're facing the virus, you are more likely to contract the virus and even conditional on contracting the the response after getting in touch with the virus is is poorer as well so it's it's more likely that you get and and more likely to develop a high severe infections if you get it because the cells are uh, very fragile uh, through the exposure um, now um, some other research like more recent research has has gone through you know, different mechanisms because they were trying to get, um, you know, which uh, types of um, mechanisms within the cell would block, for example, the effect. Uh, and so there's some very recent research uh, from a group in Columbia University where they look at um, 
for example, they are experimenting with vitamin B. Apparently, that affects some of these mechanisms of the cell and that blocks the, um, the damage, uh, especially when you are um, uh, exposed to particulate matter, 2.5. Uh, so that could be one way to uh, it doesn't it doesn't experiment with the flu or in or COVID or anything like that. It's just like the mechanism for the cells uh, to see which ones are more important than others. Uh, but it's still uh, an area of active research. Mm -hmm. And Greg also asks uh, if you have a feel for the air pollution levels of 1918 compared to today. I saw you had a bunch of comparisons with 1930s yeah. and 90s. Yeah. And, um, so if, if we extrapolate from yeah, if we extrapolate from the 30s to the to, uh, 1912, like which we have Chicago in both cases, like, uh, you know, there was a reduction, but it's still, Chicago is still very polluted. Uh, so it would be equivalent, uh, uh, you know, um, uh, so the levels in the 1918, if we extrapolate from the Chicago measurement, it would be equivalent to the worst pollution that developing countries are facing nowadays, like the days that we have, like, you know, if you look at India, India and China, when they cannot measure PM 2.5 because it, it got to the limit of the monitor, okay. it's pretty much what we had there. Uh, uh, so in, 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 in TSP, uh, Pittsburgh in the late forest, for example, reached uh, almost a thousand micrograms per cubic meter. Um, so you can see that like some cities were, uh, of course, Pittsburgh was at the, the top. So it was extreme pollution. It's not like the ones we are facing nowadays. This is just a fraction of what we had. But it's still the case that those levels are still reached in other areas mm -hmm. of the world, uh, especially the ones that we are more familiar with, like China and India, some cities in China and India. And depending on the relative um, health effect, or in this case, vulnerability effect um, of fine particles versus bigger particles. Exactly. The point was made years ago by um, Neil's colleague Spiros Pandas uh, at Carnegie Mellon in a talk he gave to EPP, Engineering Public Policy Department, that always stuck with me, which was that back in the day when the skies were dark at noon and all this, there was a lot of big particles in the air and little particles would glom onto them. And just as at the beginning, before you were able to join us, Neil was talking about droplets versus aerosols. And the aerosols can just stay suspended for days. Hey, come on in. It's too noisy. Whoops, we have come someone. In. Is that? Quiet. Oh, is that? Come. Trying to figure come out. On. Is that just your background, Edson? No. No, it's someone else. I'm not sure who. Whoever it is with the dog, mute yourself. Um, anyway. Uh, fine particles can stay suspended for days and they are also the ones that um, go so deeply into the lung. And certainly people were dying and being sick and dying of air pollution and black lung was rampant in, in coal mining where the particles were big and uh, I, I, I don't know what the size distribution of the particles were back then, but um, Spiros's point was that the little particles would glom onto the big particles because this was mostly soot and soot was sort of mm -hmm. greasy and oily and sticky. And, and so the little particles weren't there. And do you think that, and now we're, we're facing finer particles. And that's one reason that some folks in our region have said, well, it's so much cleaner than it was. And it is cleaner. We, we don't have to turn on the streetlights at, at noon and stone buildings don't turn black, but there's still a problem and it's still a serious health problem. And so um, did your study try to unlimber any of those influences of, of particle size distribution? Yeah, so that was like, uh, you know, something that we really wanted to understand because even the measurements from the 30s are total suspended particulates, right? So mm -hmm. it's like up to 100 micro microns. Uh, so we we tried like to see uh, whether some cities uh, had um, a different technologies, like the way uh, they were producing electricity, but we were not very successful because there was not so much variation. There were some power plants using um, uh, much better um, 
uh, rates of how much the heat rate that they were taking advantage of in the production of electricity, which is a, a, a proxy, an approximation for um, whether they were uh, having larger versus smaller particles, but it's just mm -hmm. like a few cities and we didn't see a lot of uh, difference there. But again, it's difficult because uh, there was um, um, other competing sources uh, for the use of coal, right? So in that sense, it's difficult to isolate uh, for only the electric sector, uh, the particles. And so it, it, we could potentially see for, for the power plants, but not for the manufacturing plants. Mm -hmm. That was a limitation of our study. Um, okay, let's see. There's... Oh, Neil clarifies, glomming has nothing to do with stickiness. If particles collide, they agglomerate. And total suspended particles correlates very strongly with PM 2.5. Well, what was Spiros talking about then, Neil? Feel free to unmute and weigh in since you're still. I think he was talking about ultrafines. Um, and it is true that when there's super high concentrations of, of larger particles, smaller particles get lost. Um, I mean, this is the mystery of new particle formation in urban areas. That's what we're studying right now. But once particles get bigger than about 30-ish nanometers, they, it takes days for them to bump into other particles. Um, though at, you know, during dust storms, it's true, we don't see as much uh, fine particles because when, the, when the, we get these crazy high TSP levels, you would mm -hmm. see less, even even PM two point five, they would they would be lost, um, and and that probably would, you know, that's that's there. There are reasons why this is also why the super cheap, um, if any spec people are on, sorry, but why they're not super, they're not all that good because they 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 can't see fine particles. They just they see light scattering off of big particles, and um, there are reasons why. The, the, the measurements don't completely perfectly correlate, but most of the time, the it's a good guess that the TSP is related to the PM two point five is related to other things. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, yeah. There, I mean that I don't want to totally poo poo it, but it, it's yeah. pretty much that PM two point five is a it, Nick Muller is is trying to go backwards to even the early early seventies. Yeah. Uh, and just say a, a multiplier, the PM 2.5 is less than the TSP, obviously, it's a subset, uh -huh. and it's some fraction. And that, that seems to work pretty well, at least going back into the, you know, the past 50 years. Um, but yeah, we would have to worry if, we, if you have a TSP of 7 um, milligrams per cubic meter, which as, as it showed that was true, then, then we have to worry a little bit about aerosol physics. Yeah, so in, in the 70s, I think one thing that we read uh, was, was that it was about, I think if I'm not wrong, it was about 40, 40 something percent that when they were trying to take the total particles and seeing like the sizes. So yeah. if you were, if you were a hundred, like then like 40 percent, I think 42, 43 percent like was uh, the ultra fine particles and then the rest was um, was uh, I think 60, about 60% 60 was the PM10. Uh, um, so um, out of the, the total standard particles, like about 60% was PM10 and then 40%. So like it's, uh, when you go smaller and it becomes smaller, but it's still pretty correlated uh, with yeah. PSP. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And there's a question in the chat about why, why higher in the winter? And it's basically because there was heating, so everyone was heating the coal in their houses, and also because the mixing height of the atmosphere tends to be less in the winter. The atmosphere is more stable, and mm -hmm. so you, you have a smaller boundary layer, and everything gets mixed into a smaller volume. Is that related to the um, inversion that we had quite recently, yep. uh, where um, it was quite warm during that period and so the what you're saying uh, that's, yeah the what that was um, that was a high pressure you get a happy high pressure system where air is subsiding and that's so you can get inversions in the summer too but 
they're more common in the winter. And there was back then, residential heating was a big but part still. of the <laughs> pollution, in addition to industry. Mm -hmm. Yeah, as I was about to say, like the, the change happened like in the late 40s, early 50s with natural gas coming into the houses. Um, so Karen has yep. like other studies showing how important the natural gas uh, pipelines that brought natural gas to so many areas of the country mm -hmm. shifted like pollution levels uh, completely in these cities. Uh, and then basically it made the power plants even more important because it took this competing source of uh, uh, use of coal in the 50s, but not, not in 1918, yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, one thing I wanted to say, I think uh, you mentioned about like, uh, you know, something about COVID. Um, so there was this study like was recently published uh, at Science Advance, I think, where they tried to use satellite uh, data, well, satellite, sorry, the measures of pollution through satellite images uh, to uh, see what is the correlation between COVID and, um, and air pollution in the US, even to the levels that we have today. And they, they seem to find like pretty uh, strong correlations there as well. Uh, and um, of course, it's still like up for debate, like how that happens biologically, I guess. But because uh, uh, initially people were, were saying like, you know, if you have some conditions, especially um, lung function that is deteriorated for some reason, you might be more uh, susceptible and so that's I think what triggered uh, this analysis so it was it was interesting because they actually talked to us about uh, how we did it for you know 1918 that they wanted to do uh, for now uh, the only problem is that they they wanted to do for the entire country and they basically had to use this um, not measurements from from EPA monitors but uh, pretty you know uh, good measures of um, aerosols I guess um, uh, for that are correlated with particulate matter. Um, and, and it was quite astonishing to see the correlation there as well. Okay, well, thank you so much, Edson. And uh, thanks, thanks for, for inviting. <laughs> carrying on that excellent research and continuing to ferret out more important relationships. Um, so uh, another bit of research that was done at uh, Carnegie Mellon is um, looking at the opposite relationship, how the pandemic affects air pollution. Um, and it's, it's recursive, of course, because then air pollution is going to affect vulnerability to the pandemic. But um, in any case, uh, we have with us um, uh, Rebecca Tanzer Groiner. Groiner? Gruner? Yeah, Gruner. <laughs> Gruner. I keep, I keep saying, shouldn't we put an umlaut out there? And she said, no, no, it's been Americanized. So yeah. um, uh, Rebecca is uh, working with some of Neil's other colleagues, uh, with Albert Presto. Who, so Rebecca is Neil's grand, academic grand babe, grandchild. <laughs> uh, and I presume you're on that research with Albert and you're his student, right? Yes, okay. So yeah, a yeah. Grad student at Carnegie Mellon in the uh, Center for Atmospheric Particle Studies, CAPS. Mm -hmm. And so it's great we have a three generation span <laughs> here. Um, and uh, uh, they, uh, as, as the pandemic closed in on us, or so we thought, it's much more severe now than it was in the spring in terms of numbers, um, but then everything was new. And so businesses shut down right, left, and Sunday. The uh, state, the, in this particular state, the governor said only life-sustaining businesses may remain in remain remain operational um so that meant you know food stores and food transportation and utilities and power and water and um that sort of thing uh but a lot of people were suddenly not going to work and 
some industries were shut down. Some industries kept going. I uh, one something that we've talked about before was the um, Shell uh, petrochemical plant, the ethane cracker up in Beaver County. Uh, they refused to shut down, and that was. A how can they say that constructing a future plastic factory um, is essential? I don't know. And they finally did shut down. They then reopened before Beaver had gone to green status. And uh, but they have had quite a bit of um, uh, coronavirus infections in within their workforce. They're transporting people back and forth on shuttle buses, um, and it's. It's hard to imagine a complicated construction project happening with uh, permanent excellent social distancing. So, um, sorry, that's one of my bugaboos, but I'm sure there's many other industries that many people would have rather shut down and didn't. Uh, but you guys, Rebecca and Albert and et al, were, um, were keeping an eye on what pollution levels were. So what can you tell us about that? Yeah. Oh, cool. Thanks so much for having me here. Um, it's us. exciting. <laughs> um, so I have a few slides I can share. I'm just gonna pull those up here. Oh, oh make you, I, I gotta make you, um, yes, I have a job to do. I failed. <laughs> I need to uh, get that window out from in front of that window and go by. And, and here's where, uh, is Robbie your mom? No, <laughs> that's He's my Robbie. hobby. So, what was that? Oh, Robbie's my husband. He's also logged on. <laughs> oh, okay, great, 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 great. Another R Tanzer. Uh, yeah, I guess. No. Oh, is that also coming up as? <laughs> okay, so I'm making you. I. It's just your mom was on, and there was a double of you. Yeah, yeah. I guess also under this uh, same but login. But here now. I'm able to, oh no! It says host disabled participant. That's weird. Uh, I think I. It was the wrong one of you. Let me find the right one up here. I gotta get rid of this. Yeah. Well, I guess while you're doing that, I could just. <laughs> I mean, you. I need to. Yeah, I need to get your window into the right way that I can make sure that it's that window that I'm doing it to, because I think I did the other you. And <laughs> hi, Rebecca's mom. Welcome wherever you are in whichever one of these little windows. Um, glad that you could join us, and you should be set now. Okay. Awesome. So let's see. It's Share screen. Oh yeah, great. So here we go. I'm going to do in present mode. Let's see. There we go. Okay, so um, <laughs> like um, I was introduced, my name is Rebecca. I'm a fifth year PhD candidate at Carnegie Mellon University and I'm advised by Albert Presto in the CAPS group. Um, and I'm going to talk a little bit about impacts of modifiable factors on ambient air pollution. And here's a picture of the Clarendon Coke Works plant, which I, I'm sure a lot of the Pittsburgh natives are familiar with. Um, it's one of my favorite field work pictures, um, but there it is. So here, um, this research, you know, started um, back in March. I was basically going for a walk uh, shortly after the university closed and everything was shutting down and was just sort of thinking about how, you know, all these businesses are closing, people aren't going to work, and how we still had ramp sensors, which I'll get to talking about, um, all throughout Pittsburgh. And I was wondering if we could see the changes in the air quality on our sensors. Um, so basically this, this outline here is something we all lived through. You don't really need to look at a chart to, to know what happened, but basically the point is that by mid-March, our lives were pretty different, right? Um, businesses were closed, and I'm sort of highlighting also the closures in Ohio, um, because that's upwind of us here in Pittsburgh. So what what's not happening in Ohio is also affecting southwestern Pennsylvania. Um, so we've all seen images that look like this, I'm sure, where you have you know, landmarks all over the world um, shown covered in smog where you can't even, you know, see a few, <laughs> few meters in front of you. And then after all the closures, how all of a sudden you could see these beautiful sights um, and clear skies. And um, 
this was this was sort of what got me thinking like can we measure these differences in pollutants like beyond just these impactful pictures what's the what are the numbers actually saying um so we set out to quantify the impact of the covid related shutdowns on the local air quality and we wanted to do this utilizing our dense network of low cost sensors so for those of you who may not know the caps lab has um, low-cost sensors that are all throughout Pittsburgh. We call them, they're the real-time affordable, because um, they're lower costs than regulatory monitors, real-time affordable multi pollutant huh. their packages. Um, and I'll call them ramps for short. So here's the inside of a ramp. Um, basically, it's made up of off-the-shelf um, sensors, and they are mostly electrochemical sensors um, used to measure different pollutants. So we can measure uh, any mixture of gases uh, or a mixture of a few different gases. So we can look at CO, NO2, ozone, um, NO, SO2, and some VOCs. Some of these sensors work better than others. Um, we also couple, couple the ramp box with a like MET1 uh, nephilometer to measure PM2.5. So here's a nice picture of a ramp and it's, you know, PM monitor um, together out in the field. So these things are pretty portable. I can hold it in two hands and take it out to various locations. At the height of our sensor network, a few years ago, we had almost 50 or over 50 out throughout Pittsburgh. Um, but at the start of the pandemic, we had 27 that were out in the field. So a really good resource um, to be able to look into a high, highly resolved spatial um, resolution of these of different pollutants. So at the start of the pandemic, we had sensors at each of these locations. We had three at high traffic sites. So those were two downtown and one site along 376. So sort of highway and you know, downtown areas. We had 11 sensors that were in urban residential areas. So think places that have fair amount of traffic as well as restaurants and um, people moving around throughout the day. We had eight sensors in what I call suburban residential areas. They're a bit outside the bounds of the city um, or outside the river sort of bounds. Um, much more residential, fewer cars, fewer restaurants. Um, we had four sensors downwind of um, like industrial facilities. Two were by the Clarendon Coke Works plant, which you saw that picture earlier, and two were downwind of the Braddock Steel Mill. Um, so those were interesting locations to have. We also utilized data from two Allegheny County Health Department sites. Um, so those are regulatory monitors, not our ramps, uh, used to look at NO2 since we, we have a little bit uh, more difficulty like processing data from the NO2 sensors that we, we just sort of incorporated the regulatory monitor sites for, for that data. Um, but this is where our sensors were. Um, very interesting uh, sort of spread and we got to get to really like dive into that. So, so what did the air quality look like? So we could start by looking at CO. Um, so here we have the beginning of March, 2020, and you could see the CO concentrations um, throughout the first two weeks of March. And if we compare this to measurements uh, from the previous March, we could see that the uh, CO measurements were pretty consistent with historical data. So back in 2019, you could see that the, this box plot um, shows the like, typical CO values are pretty much in line with the typical CO values uh, in the beginning of March. And then you have these outliers, which are, are pretty consistent with the spikes that we got in the beginning of March as well. Um, but then what happens right after March 14th, which is sort of like a marker on when did people stop going to work, driving to work, when did kids stop going to school, things changed pretty suddenly. Um, and look at those measurements are much lower, far fewer, like no spikes basically during that time. And um, like was mentioned, this work was conducted all 
um, in the spring. So we only go through the end of April, although there's a lot more interesting information like moving forward, uh, which I can address at the end. But we could see that people got, maybe there was a little bit of fatigue that happened even after one month, which is sort of crazy to think about at this point <laughs> because it's so many months later. But you could see that there are a few more um, higher CO measure measurements um, over the course of that second month. Um, but overall, the mean CO at all of the sites was 233 ppb, which is um, significantly less than the CO measurements during like the pre-pandemic time, um, and more significantly, the 90th percentile of CO at all sites was 365 ppb, while uh, during pre-COVID time, um, the 90th percentile measurements were far larger at 50, 537 TPV. Um, so you can see that we're really just not seeing those high spikes um, really during this period. Uh, I also want to point out this, this graph over here. It shows the cumulative distribution function of all the measurements, where the purple line are the post-closures measurements, and the, the red line are from March 2019, so sort of that pre-COVID marker. And you could see that the mean, median, the median concentrations are actually pretty up to the median. The concentrations are pretty similar, but there are far, far fewer high concentration of vents um, post closures. So you're really not seeing those spikes happening anywhere um, in the in the domain study domain. Um, and if we draw our attention um, to the other sites, so that those were the urban residential sites, but if we look at the high traffic sites as well as the suburban residential sites, you could see similar patterns where up to the median, um, we could see very sim many similarities in the measurements. However, larger at the, those like higher concentrations, those we're not seeing those spikes post closure. Um, this is different though than the measurements taken at the industrial sites, um, which I think was sort of, touched upon the fact that, you know, we, we weren't measuring by the cracker plant, but how like certain industrial facilities were or weren't put on the essential businesses list. And we do know that eventually, although not at first, the steel production processes were put on the essential business list. And you could sort of see that here that we have very similar measurements of CO before and after closures at the industrial sites. Um, so interesting thing to sort of uh, be able to observe from our sensor network. Um, if we draw our attention to PM 2.5, obviously another important pollutant to look at. Um, we can see what the what the the time series sort of looks like before the pandemic, um, and you see these higher concentrations rising. And if we keep in the back of our mind that um, the EPA regulates PM 2.5 to be less than 12 micrograms per meter cube, and you sort of keep that in your in the back of your mind, you could see that these are pretty high concentrations of PM2.5. So see those, those are events, although most of the time we are lower than that 12 microgram per meter cube mark. Um, and this is consistent, so the beginning of March 2020, consistent with you know prior like historic data in March 2019. Um, and then following the closures, we see fewer high concentration events. Um, and again, if we look at the mean PM2.5 concentration at all sites post closures, it's pretty low at 6.7 micrograms per meter cubed. Again, thinking about that hourly average um, sort of mark at uh, that 12 micrograms per meter cubed. Um, whereas before the pandemic, uh, it was much higher at 9.5 micrograms per meter cube. The 90th percentile um, was still below that 12 microgram per meter cube mark at 11.4 micrograms per meter cube. Um, whereas in pre-pandemic measurements, the 90th percentile, so those high spikes, was up to 17.4 micrograms per meter cube. So interesting things. And again, we can look at the, the cumulative distribution function. And something that jumps out here is that as opposed to the CO measurements, uh, they are significantly different um, all throughout the you know, distribution. So that was something interesting to see. And again, this is just the urban residential sites. So areas, again, where people live, um, you know, you have some traffic, some restaurants, 
And we could see that they're pretty, the results here are pretty similar at actually all of the sites, even the industrial sites. So that, that's something sort of to think about and, and you know, an, an interesting result to see. So we, we looked at, you know, the whole sort of data set that we had, and then we wanted to like dive a little deeper into what did this mean on a day-to-day -day sort of basis. Um, so over here, we're gonna look at the, like, the daily patterns. So looking at the diurnal pattern of CO measurements um, throughout the day, you can see this is just the high traffic sites and this is for like pre-COVID measurements. So we're looking using March 2019 as a marker here. And you could see that you have lower um, CO in the, you know, I guess early, early morning or middle of the night. And then up here you have, you see an, a large increase, which is clearly the morning rush hour. You have people going to work. Um, getting in their cars, buying breakfast um, at restaurants, so you, or well, I guess CEO, that's less important. So really you see the traffic, it's really that morning rush hour peak, and then it, it levels off and you see a little bit of uh, an enhancement in the evening as well. Um, if we look at suburban sites prior to the pandemic, um, you see a similar pattern, except um, that morning rush hour peak sort of begins earlier, which does make sense because, you know, people need to get to their, where they're going, like get to those downtown areas um, before they get there. Like they need to go there before they get there. So they start driving in the suburban areas before they reach their destination in those high traffic areas. So you see that morning rush hour peak, um, again, that sort of drop, that trough in the middle of the day and a little bit of an increase um, when people are, you know, coming home in the evening. So what did this pattern of like CEO measurements look like post pandemic uh, or like not post pandemic, post start of the pandemic or post closures? Um, here we have the suburban measurements of CEO throughout the day and the shaded green area are, is the uncertain, instrument uncertainty. Um, but for the most part, you see that that pattern, that change in CO throughout the day is, is fairly gone. Um, and it's really sort of leveled off that background throughout the whole day. Um, and if we look at the high traffic sites, it's really interesting to see that these sites, they look like the suburban sites. So both areas, really CO, CO emissions have gone like significantly down and they don't really vary throughout the day, um, which is, you know, maybe intuitive, you know, people aren't driving to work and school and et cetera, um, but it, it's really interesting to be able to capture that um, with our sensor network. So um, if we look at other pollutants, we have the NO2 measurements. And again, these are from the Allegheny County uh, Health Department sites, um, not from our ramps. And you see a very similar pattern with NO2. You see that, that increase in the morning and that sort of trough in the middle of the day, and again, an increase while people are driving home. Uh, in the suburban areas, it's not as uh, close, I guess, like the NO2 emissions aren't as close to the traffic emissions of NO2 as we saw in CO, and that could really be just because um, the sites are different, because this is the Allegheny County Health Department site, not our ramp sites, and it happens to be that the suburban site we used um, just based on where the regulatory monitor was, is a bit um, like more towards rural than the sites we have for our ramp sites that we were measuring CO at, but you could still see that similar pattern. Um, and then post pandemic, you see that the high traffic sites basically look like that really far out there suburban site and that emissions of NO2 really decreased and their vari variability throughout the day really decreased um, following the closures. So interesting thing, interesting thing to complement um, our ramp network with some regulatory monitors. Um, and now uh, I'll draw your attention to some PM 2.5 measurements. So you can see it's a little less variable throughout the day, um, but we do still see a morning sort of rush hour enhancement there's maybe more enhancement overnight. Um, and again, that, that like trough in the middle of the day when you, you know, the boundary layer is largest and you have the most dilution of pollutants. Um, so if we compare the high traffic site though with what's interesting is the industrial site. Um, you can see that the industrial site, the PM 2.5 concentrations are 
are really high in the middle of the night um, into the early morning, uh, which is interesting. It's a very different diurnal pattern than we see at the high traffic sites. And this is largely because of two reasons. One, emissions, and two, sort of the meteorology. So the emissions, the coke plant does emit overnight, whereas traffic emissions tend not to. Lots of people are on the road. Um, and as well as the boundary layer is sort of the smallest then, so you have highest concentration or, you know, less <laughs> area or volume for your pollutants to be in, so the concentration is higher. So those two factors coupled um, lead to higher PM2.5 enhancements overnight. Um, but what's interesting, we could see the PM2.5 concentrations at the high traffic sites really uh, decrease down to background uh, levels at the high traffic sites post closures, and there is really little variability throughout the day. Whereas if we look at the industrial sites, although they decreased, um, there is still this variability throughout the day. And you can see that they most likely were still emitting overnight, um, which is not fully wrong because they, they were eventually put on the you know, uh, essential businesses list. So it is interesting to see that, but maybe they were emitting less or maybe the industrial, the PM2.5 concentrations at the industrial sites were also lower because there was less traffic. Traffic We would need to be able to explore more to like probe into more of the why, but it's interesting to see these patterns and how they change uh, over, over between the start of, or pre-pandemic and post-closures. Um, but interesting to delve into. So um, one other thing we wanted to look at was isolating the traffic enhancement. So we were able to sort of hone in on the traffic um, related PM2.5 um, uh, or the increase in PM2.5 due to traffic by isolating the rush hour um, period. And if you look at this plot here, uh, the purple grayed out area, is, is the instrument uncertainty. And we have each of the traffic, or not each of the site groups. So we have the high traffic, urban, suburban, and industrial sites. And pre-COVID, you could see that the traffic related enhancement at the three, the, the traffic and the residential sites was roughly similar, somewhere around 1.4 micrograms per meter cubed, maybe a little less at the suburban sites. And the industrial site was, was not really, not so significant. Really the PM2.5 uh, emissions at the industrial sites were mostly coming from the industrial sites um, and not from traffic. So we could see that pretty clearly in this technique that we used. Um, but post COVID, what's interesting is all sites post COVID, their traffic induced enhancement um, was diminished to levels indistinguishable from zero based on our instrument uncertainty. So really, post-COVID, the PM2.5 concentrations um, from traffic became become really neg negligible. And this is this is I'm only speaking through April. Um, things probably changed post that, um, and it, it'll be interesting to sort of delve into that moving forward to see how things changed as the pandemic uh, chugged on. Um, but we can also do a similar uh, uh, technique with CO traffic enhancement. Um, so again, here are the shaded areas, instrument uncertainty. And we could see that pre-COVID, the traffic enhancement, like the CO traffic enhancement was, you know, similar at most sites, but higher at the high traffic sites. Um, and then post-closures, um, the CO, traffic related enhancement is indistinguishable from zero at the urban, suburban, and industrial sites, but we could still see some, some enhancement at sites. And what's really interesting here is that that decrease is actually 50%. So the traffic enhancement at the high traffic sites decreased by 50%, which is consistent with the reported decrease in commuter traffic which we, we put at 47.6%. And we got to that number um, sort of in two ways. One, 
using the Google mobility data and to using um, traffic cameras on, you know, high traffic um, routes towards downtown in Pittsburgh. And we were able to see that basically there was a one-to-one -one ratio, a relationship between the decrease in traffic related CO emissions and the actual decrease in commuters. Um, so, so that was pretty interesting to see. Um, similarly, when we look at the NO2 traffic enhancement, at only again, we only have information for high traffic and suburban sites, but we could see that they also at the high traffic site decreased by 50%. So the NO2 traffic enhancement as well as the CO traffic enhancement decreased by 50% which is very consistent with the decrease in commuter traffic. Um, and yeah, as I said, similar decrease. So one, one sort of last area that we wanted to look at was the industrial um, enhancement in PM 2.5. And to do that, we looked at the industrial sites. So here's an, a diurnal, so the, the daily pattern of PM 2.5 concentrations at the industrial sites. Um, and we know that a lot of, we, get, we have an easier time isolating the industrial emissions um, overnight because there are few other uh, emission sources during that time. Again, people aren't on the road, um, maybe not cooking. <laughs> so, so a lot of other uh, sources aren't as relevant during these times. So we looked at the emissions overnight from about 2 to 4 a.m. And we looked at the suburban background sites at that same time. And we took the uh, mean uh, of the industrial sites, PM 2.5 concentration from 2 to 4 AM, and subtracted out the suburban background sites at those same times. And that difference is what we're calling the industrial enhancement. So that is sort of the PM 2.5 concentrations that you're seeing um, that we're, we're attributing just to the industrial sites. Um, and if we look at, um, and we did the same thing for CO as well. So if we look at the pre-COVID closures uh, data for the PM 2.5 industrial enhancement, um, we see it's a almost it's at almost three micrograms per meter cube. And post um, closures, it it does come down to about 1.7 uh, PM 2.5 or 1.7 micrograms per meter cube. But you could see with the instrument uncertainty that that is, it's not clear that that's a significant decrease because their uncertainties sort of overlap. Um, and even more, uh, to illustrate the point even more, if we look at the uh, CO industrial enhancement um, at the industrial sites pre-closures, and then look at the CO enhancement post-closures, we see that they are not significantly different. So whether the industrial sites um, or the industrial influenced like pollutant, uh, emissions changed is hard to determine with our, our sensors, but it seems like if they did change, it changed very little and um, they may not, it may not be a significant change. So overall, um, we know that the PM2.5 concentrations decreased fairly uniformly across the entire domain. Um, and that, that's because of a lot of factors, but mostly, well, PM 2.5 is very complicated, um, but it is more regional than, say, the other pollutants we're looking at. Um, but across the whole domain, it, it decreased during this time frame by about three micrograms per meter cubed. So that's a 29% reduction in PM 2.5 across the entire study domain. And if you look at this plot, this is more visual, fun than uh, like <laughs> informational, but if you see the colors on the spot, you could see how they all sort of decrease down to a similar level. So I could go back and you could watch the colors change again. So <laughs> see the, the PM 2.5 concentrations decrease uh, pre and post closures. If we turn our attention back to CO measurements, uh, they decreased less uniformly than PM 2.5. Um, and that's because of the sort of more direct nature of CO. We know CO is coming from uh, like from vehicles. It's a pretty good tracer of vehicle emissions. Um, it's you know less less a result of like reactions as PM two point five is less regional. Um, but we did see a twenty percent decrease in CO at the high traffic and urban residential sites, um, and only a ten percent decrease uh, at the suburban and at the suburban residential sites. 
Um, and again, you could look at the map and the dots and see the sort of diverse uh, color scheme or you know, pretty big range of colors uh, of the measurements pre-COVID and see how they're sort of taken down a notch um, you know, across the study domain. Um, in conclusion, um, this is this graphic sums it all up. <laughs> Basically, we know there there were less cars on the road. The there were similar amounts of emissions, and because of all of, from industrial sites, and because of all that, we ended up with less PM two point five CO and NO two. Um, but in words, um, we know that the major effects on air quality as a result of the COVID shutdown were from more so from vehicle emissions, not from a reduction in industry emissions. And we were able to really utilize this natural experiment to quantify the effect of large changes in vehicle emissions on PM2.5, CO, and NO2. And we'd really hope that these findings will be able to be utilized in policy decisions regarding low or no emitting vehicles. Um, you know, there's a lot more work that needs to be done, but it's an interesting way to sort of imagine what if 50% of vehicles on the road did not emit um, pollutants um, in a you know very electric vehicle uh, focused future. Um, so it's an interesting thing to think about. Um, to conclude or like in <laughs> in wrapping up, I really want to acknowledge everyone that took this research, helped me take this research from just an idea um, in mid March to a published paper in June. So it was really fast turnover and it was really fun working with everyone. There were a lot of emails back and forth, a lot of quick meetings. Um, so definitely big thanks to Jayu, Rose, Alan, and of course, Albert. Um, and then of course, uh, like big acknowledgement to just CAPS as a whole and CMU. And at this point, I'd like to take any questions. I think I saw questions popping up in the chat, but I wasn't able to like look at them while talking. So I could, I could start looking at them or maybe if people want to say them out loud, we can do that. Um, I don't know. I guess I can start looking at the questions. Um, let's see. Um, someone, let's see. I noticed that the morning, I guess Greg is saying, I noticed that the morning rush hour seems much bigger than the afternoon uh, rush as measured by CO. Do you understand why? Um, so I'd say that one of the reasons why is is more um, one factor at least is sort of like atmospheric that the boundary layer is lower in the morning than like by the afternoon. So even if you're emitting the same amount of pollutants, they the concentrations will come out larger in the morning. Um, you know, if anyone has, I mean, like Neil's on the call. If if any of that is <laughs> you can elaborate, but. Uh, yep, that's right. Yeah, I, I would say that that would be my biggest uh, sort of <laughs> rationale for that. Um, cool. Uh, let's see the next. Oh, Neil wrote that answer right under it. So yeah, great. <laughs> Thank you. Um, then after that, Patty. Hi, Patty. It's cool to see. I work for Patty or I used to work for Patty at the gym um, when I could teach classes at the gym. So it's cool to see you on here. <laughs> Hi, Rebecca. Hi. <laughs> Good to see you. did great. Congratulations. <laughs> Thanks. So do you want to ask your question instead of me reading it out? Sure. I just wanted to know if these industries emit things at night because there's less OSHA regulators like that might pop in or give them a fine. I just, in my mind, I think this happens and it sounds like your data kind of confirms this and I just <laughs> want to know what you thought. Yeah, I don't know. Like, I can't say for sure if that's like true or not. It, I would, I would just like that sounds like a reasonable <laughs> guess. <laughs> say that I also do have some other information that um, back like years ago, my first, like sort of the first bit of data I looked at as a PhD student was looking at SO two measurements over the course of you know it was over years. <laughs> like looking at days and that Sundays seem to be irregularly high. So there were mm -hmm. <laughs> higher um, SO2 measurements on Sunday. Mm -hmm. That was also sort of a conversation I remember having like way back 
um, like, is this, like, like, is, is this by accident or are they emitting more on the sun? Like, I, I don't know. I don't know. But it's a, maybe an interesting observation. <laughs> Thank you. Um, All and right. Yes, yeah, sorry to um, be uh, vapor for a little while. Um, our remaining speaker had a plumbing and computer crisis. <laughs> but he's here with us, yay. So uh, yeah, if you're rolling on the Q&A, that's, um, that's definitely fine because I had to step away for a bit. Um, and apologies, normally I try to make it so you don't have to follow the chat so much, but there's been some, my glass of yeah. the uh, yeah. Do you want to take over the Q and A? Well, well, I at this point, if you can, that's great. Because <laughs> I'm not sure what you've already said because I had to step away and get uh, Bernie all set up. So mm -hmm. uh, there, there still is discussion. Yeah, I'm just uh, reading the things. Vision doesn't go anywhere. It doesn't make us like okay. Uh, so Candice is saying radon concentrations also follow this pattern. Okay. And then Neil said anything coming from the surface does. Let's see. <laughs> is there another question here? Uh, Greg wrote, it seems like you should be able to distinguish between local sources of pollution versus pollution drifting in from afar or from far away. But local pollution should be affected by the local mixing height. But it seems like pollution from far away would not be dependent on the Okay. Yeah, that would be an interesting thing to look into. Um, then Laura said, so glad you see here, you're able to take advantage of data collection during this rapid change in data. Yep, cool, mm -hmm. appreciate it. And then more thanks. <laughs> um, yeah, so if anyone else has questions they wanna. Okay, it looks like Ed does. Ed, do you wanna unmute yourself? Yeah, just Thank what's you. next? Yeah, what, what so. What will you be studying next? What other questions does this raise for you? Yeah, so I mean, it's a two part answer there. So one thing of what I'm doing next has nothing, nothing in quotes to do with this. I'm actually starting to look at um, emissions of like, from like different chemical products, like organic, uh, com different organic compounds, uh, more like volatile ones, um, specifically from paint. So I'm just like getting into more lab work. So I'm excited about that. But in relation to this, <laughs> what I am doing next is I'm hoping over sort of like the next few months to dive into expanding this research. And like, as, as I said, I pretty much stopped data collection at April, but we know that the pandemic has been chugging along since. So looking at maybe, you know, how the, the emissions changed, you know, moving on as specifically as Pennsylvania went from like red to yellow to green and then now we're like going back or not officially going back but sort of how we should be yeah <laughs> but they're not doing that but however <laughs> like how things have changed moving forward sure, yeah. and taking a deeper dive looking at you know historical data and like hammering down comparisons so that's sort of what i'm planning on doing next in relation to this i will say also one thing that um i'm intrigued by is with the geographic uh, resolution. The, all of these data allow us to start to think about EJ issues, right? Mm -hmm. So we know where pollution levels are higher and lower. We know what socioeconomic, um, uh, you know, the, from the census, these are, they can be resolved to census track uh, levels. And so looking at whether there's disparity in the in exposure in general, but then also through interventions around um, you know, COVID mitigation and everything else is super interesting. Yeah, that is pretty cool. Actually, like my first paper was looking at PM 2.5 differences in Pittsburgh um, and EJ sort of factors. So maybe like tying in some of that previous work and like laying, layering it on top would be pretty cool to look at. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, it is... Uh so many um, factors go into is that now, I mean, when you look at COVID where 
vitamin D deficiencies seem to be a problem. And it's like they don't have enough trouble, but black people with more melanin in the skin have less vitamin D in their system. And that already puts them more at risk of more serious COVID. So um, we need to attack wherever we can and, and uh, pollution from industrial facilities is a, uh, a clear, clear target. Um, and so, uh, and our next speaker will be speaking to that very factor. And thank you so much, Rebecca, for, for joining us. And, uh, yeah, thanks for having me. Um, and sharing that great, that great work. You are, we're just Johnny's on the spot, as it were, with the ramps. So thank yeah. you so much. Oh, cool. thanks so much. <laughs> um, all right. So our last speaker is uh, the very distinguished uh, Bernard Goldstein, who was the dean of the Pitt Graduate School, Graduate School for Public Health for many years. Um, before that, he was um, worked in the EPA as uh, Assistant Administrator for Research and Development and was on the Clean Air Scientific Advisory uh, Committee under Ronald Reagan. So he's worked in a whole variety of political um, and governmental uh, regimes and realms and is even now working on trying to get the EPA, the current EPA administrator, uh, Wheel, Andrew Wheeler to um, do what he should be doing uh, in light of the relationships that we've been looking at, in light of the effect of um, uh, air chronic exposure to air pollution on one's vulnerability or the vulner collective vulnerability of populations uh, to viruses and uh, health problems like COVID. So, uh, and, and I should note that I believe Bernie does win the prize today for the farthest away participant. He is in Anchorage, Alaska in his new home and where he has, if he seems a little out of breath and if I do, it's because he just has been working hard to overcome a plumbing disaster in their new home and lots of computer issues. So uh, uh, we did manage to get him connected up here on his phone. Yay. And uh, take it away, Bernie. Oh, oh, Bernie, you're muted. You are, oh dear. This would be very sad if it's all silent. It does show you as muted, I think. Do, 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 do. Can I unmute you? I'm trying and failing to unmute you. So Bernie, uh, if you touch the screen, I think he hasn't done a whole lot of- Can you hear that? Yay, okay. okay he hasn't good. zoomed in by the way before. So. Are you there are all sorts of wonderful new technology for, uh, as I told Marin, what I miss most is my grandchildren and I particularly miss my grandson who's an expert on just doing these, making these kind of things happen. I usually call for him. Um, the, uh, uh, what Marin's asked me to do is to, is to include some history. And so uh, I'll, I'll start with, with uh, putting uh, in perspective what I wanna talk about, which is on one hand, COVID-19 and its interaction with the, with the ozone and the uh, PM 2.5 standards but primarily I want to talk, I want to make the emphasis on the standards themselves. Uh, there's a provision in the Clean Air Act uh, that I'll be talking about. It's, it's a key provision. It has to do with national ambient air quality standards. And the idea in 1970 was to uh, go after those things that we could see and that we know were bad, and we would set outdoor standards for them. Um, and there's six of them right now that for which we have outdoor standards. Um, the two that most affect the fossil fuel industry are particulate matter, which you've heard a lot about already, and ozone. Um, they're, um, 
the, the, uh, these standards, these so-called NAC standards, NAC stand for National Ambient Air Quality Standards, uh, are, have to be reviewed every five years under the Clean Air Act. And uh, that's a very important provision of the Clean Air Act. And it's one of the reasons we continue to get more information about pollutants uh, that are part of this National Ambient Air Quality Standards setting process, because we must review them every five years. For most uh, environmental pollutant uh, standards, what we end up with is a situation in which the, uh, uh, the pollutant, uh, if it's standard once established, is then abandoned in terms of any further research because, hey, we got to go set another standard. We don't have to look at this again until somebody forces us to do so. But uh, the Clean Air Act standards, uh, we have to look at them again because we have this five-year deadline. Now, this five-year deadline's almost never been met. It's usually six or seven or eight. Uh, but uh, when President Trump came in with uh, uh, the support of the fossil fuel industry, they had a problem. If they waited for five years to get the process going um, on ozone and particulates, they probably would not be able to complete it until uh, after the, uh, uh, the after their the, their first term might be up. Uh, and in particular, there were standards that were more out of date than ozone and partic than particulates. So how could they jump the queue? Well, they suddenly claimed that they must keep to five years and uh, they must do this by moving ahead rapidly with ozone and particulates. And I, I may misled you a bit. Basically, ozone and particulates would have been looked at in the relatively near future, but not quick enough if if you kept in line the idea that uh, we, we have to catch up with this five-year thing. So this gave them a rationale. Um, it's not a very good rationale, and I'm not sure a court would buy it, because basically if your argument is that we have to keep up with the five years required in the Clean Air Act, then you would go for the standards that you were most out of date, and that's not ozone and particulates. Two of the standards are uh, more out of date than ozone and particulates. But if you start with their rationale, which is, gee, there's some science out there that looks like it's going to require a more stringent ozone and particulate standards. We'll have a tougher time. Uh, we better make sure that under our watch, these standards are looked at so we can make sure the standards are not made stricter than they already are. Here's what we, ha we have to do. We've got to speed up on this and we'll come up with this rationale. Uh, so that, that sort of colors everything I'm going to say after this. The Clean Air Act is a 1970 act. Uh, we in Pittsburgh already had an act uh, that basically grandfathered in some of these, these, these ideas. But um, when it looked at the National Ambient Air Quality Standards, when it set these standards, it, it set it in such a way that um, there really was no formal scientific advice given on it. It just was set a standard. By the time the Clean Air Act was revised for lots and lots of reasons, it, and this is 1977, one of the problems that was seen is, well, look, if we let the administrator just set the standard um, and the administrator has all these scientists working for the administrator, uh, so this is EPA's internal scientific uh, folks, and, and as Aaron said, I was, I was head of EPA's research and development. I was confirmed by the U.S. Senate to do, do that job. Uh, uh, under Bill Ruckel's house and his second coming in, in the 1980s. Well, if you, left it, if you left it up, just the internal EPA scientists, well, the internal EPA scientists might be pushed around by the uh, administrator of EPA to say, you know, gee, don't you want to have uh, the standard that I want? Uh, and uh, there's lots of internal issues that uh, go on on a day-to-day -day basis in a bureaucracy that left Congress um, not trusting the way they'd written the Clean Air Act, they're wanting to get an external process involved to see what the external scientific committee uh, community uh, thought of this. And so they, they prepared uh, this series of approaches which basically said, we start with a Clean Air Science Advisory Committee. This is called CASAC, and CASAC, uh, again, part of the 1977 Clean Air Act, consists of seven members, and they specified that at least one member must be a member of the National Academy of Science and one physician and one state official involved with air pollution, uh, and, but just these seven members, and these seven members make a recommendation. And the recommendation, uh, I chaired it way back when, and when I chaired it, I, we basically came up with a formulation that said, uh, 
we, the, the committee, think that the standard ought to be between 0.08 and 0.10. A reasonable scientist will differ in that range. We remind you, Madam Administrator, Mr. Administrator, that at the higher number, there is no margin of safety. Now, that's a buzzword. It's a little bit of jargon, but it's crucial to what I'm going to tell you. Margin of safety is, if you will, a public health consideration. And it's a public health consideration in that we can't be sure that we're right and we want to err on the side of safety. We don't want to just pick a, a number as if we're absolutely sure, even though it may be the best number, but if there's uncertainty, we need that. In fact, the language uh, is, and I'm going to read it to you. I'm sorry, I don't have the slides prepared with everything. Um, it says, to address uncertainties associated with inconclusive scientific and technical information, and to provide a reasonable degree of protection against hazards that research has not yet identified. We need a margin of safety. That's a very strong public health statement, and it comes from Congress, it's not just a bunch of us pointy-headed public health folks. It's what Congress says must be happen. And Congress made, made a very interesting distinction. They basically said, and this is going in front of the, uh, in front of the Supreme Court uh, since then, just to be sure, that it's, uh, it's not up to CASAC to tell the administrator what the margin of safety ought to be. It's up to the administrator. The administrator chooses the margin of safety. So basically, if you just stop there, a wheel could, you know, the current administrator could say whatever they want. And uh, what, uh, I'll give you the, the final one. They, they say nothing about margin of safety. Uh, except to have all this language I'm quoting you. This language is boilerplate. It's in every single uh, proposal for a Clean Air Act uh, standard, and it's in the boilerplate for the ozone and, and, and particulate standards. So what I'm reading to you is, is just what's there. Um, and uh, in doing that, um, the, the administrator, however, they don't trust the administrator. As we well know, Congress doesn't trust the executive and vice versa. And so Congress said, hey, but you know, you can't just pull this out of thin air. What they say, and again, I'll try to read it, but of course the screen went blank and I'll just turn it right back on. So it was doing that. As far as I know, the flood has not yet reached. No, I'm on the top floor, floor. but no, oh, okay, good. <laughs> <laughs> I'm on top of it. And but it's been quite a day control. We got it under you. control. We got it under control. Um, uh, but basically, um, uh, the, the, the two key things, it says the, con the, the administrator must take into account the nature and severity of the risk. In other words, if it's uh, well, some eye irritation, and we're not certain about, about that, maybe it's you know, more stringent. Well, that's not exactly a, a, a major uh, endpoint. But COVID-19, obviously, the nature and severity of the risk includes death. So that's pretty, pretty severe. And the other a point that it must take into account is the number of people at risk. So that there's, for instance, there's a very uh, rare uh, kind of uh, inherited disorder in which uh, sulfur dioxide, any sulfur, uh, will hasten this baby's death. And babies usually die before they're a year or two years old. It might be, I can't remember what's 10 or 100 kids born a year in the U.S. with this. And you can argue that, well, keep the sulfur dioxide, this is a, a population at risk, and we should keep the sulfur dioxide level down at zero, where it just hastens these kids' death. No, no, it's 10 or 100 kids. No, the number's too small in the Clean Air Act. Uh, uh, just ba basically EPA just sort of, I think appropriately avoids uh, making a standard based upon that. So what we have is two separate approaches. Now CASAC for, uh, for particulates a little ahead of ozone, about a month or two ahead, um, came out with its um, proposal with no uh, change in the standard. In other words, keep the old standard just like the industry and the, the EPA leadership wanted. In December, uh, the, um, uh, for, for particulates, I think it was early January for, for ozone. Um, so basically it was before the COVID-19 occurred uh, that we had these, the, uh, okay, uh, just keep it as it is, just as you want, uh, Mr. Weir. Um, uh, that gets now into the issue, but, but who's CASAC now? Uh, CASAC uniquely now is a group that's unqualified. Uh, KSAC uh, has been a really strong program of how you do external advice to an agency, uh, which has been copied all around the world. And uh, its members, however, have always been people highly respected in the academic community. 
Uh, its chair has been someone who is generally not taking an opinion or a position on these issues before. Um, instead, what we had was as the, the members retired, they had, were replaced by people who simply were not uh, appropriate for the, uh, for the job. And not necessarily that they're biased. The chair is biased in the sense of, of uh, not, not that he perhaps has stock or something in the, in the companies, but he's biased in, in the sense that we use the term in science, and that he would, in the sense that he would never be the chair of a National Academy committee uh, that looked at something like this, because he has come out very strongly and said that the, uh, uh, these standards are, are, are simply not based upon the best possible science. He's quarreled with how epidemiology is, is done. He believes that the epidemiology is inappropriate. And he himself is not an epidemiologist. He's a biostatistician. He's a very good statistician. And he's a member of National Academy of Sciences for it. But uh, he clearly has a point of view you saying that they're uh, pushing that that's that this, the existing standards are not based upon good science and so he's he's one member right? he's also the chair and he has a lot of power for that uh, there are as i said there has to be one person who represents the uh, the, the the states uh represent the fo folks who are really getting their hands dirty uh working with the issues of pollutants in the community uh, the administrator of EPA basically said, well, you know, we've got to do a better job on geographical representation. Uh, I know what I'll do. I'll put in four members of this seven-member committee who come from, from different uh, states and who are working uh, for uh, governmental organizations. And these, these, are, these are real experts. I mean, they, they, they know how to do the measurement. They know how to do exposure assessment. Uh, uh, so uh, there's no question about their expertise, but there's never before been more than one. Now there's four, and just by coincidence, all four of them happen to work in Republican administrations. So they're reporting to a Republican governor, or in one case, the Republican county commissioner. Um, what you have is clearly a biased group, uh, in a sense, or a potentially biased group. And most importantly, you don't have the disciplines one needs to, to deal with this. You have one physician, you have one ecologist, because the, the, the Case Act also sets the secondary standard, which is an ecosystem standard, and uh, that's the seven members. Missing from this is an epidemiologist. It, I can't remember, and nobody else that I've speak, spoken to who've, measured, uh, who, who've been involved in this for all these years can ever remember uh, uh, Case Act not having an epidemiologist. No one is there to stand up to Again, this uh, person who is the, the chair, who's, uh, who's come up and, and basically said epidemiology, the epidemiology that has supported these standards is, is very weak and should not be uh, used. Um, well, you know, that, that uh, Congress also, actually this wasn't done by Congress, it's done by EPA. There's, uh, there's a, a backup in a sense. Any seven member committee may miss having a sufficient expertise uh, in breadth or in depth about each of these different pollutants. Not all of them have the same effects. They have very different organs that they affect. And um, so what CASAC has done since, and I was on the committee, I think in 1979, when they first started this uh, for ozone and, and also for particulates, is, has set up um, subcommittees. Now these subcommittees review the data and there may be 20 or 25 members. And we're talking now about uh, perhaps a thousand papers in the in the compilation of the research that EPA does. And so we, what you have is a subcommittee of experts on this specific pollutant. And they give advice to KSAC. And based upon that advice, KSAC then comes to its decision. And it's all done publicly. Well, gee, in order to speed up the process and to cut down on waste from wa these wasteful prolonged processes, uh, Mr. Wheeler, the head of EPA, just decided to uh, cancel these subcommittees. The particulate subcommittee was already in, in effort, already working. The ozone subcommittee had been started and uh, had been chosen at least. And they basically they said, "Well, we will we'll do this without subcommittees." So now you're left with a seven-member committee, handpicked by the administrator, uh, chaired by someone who clearly has a bias, uh, making a decision without any epidemiologist to help them on what's primarily epidemiological data. 
And guess what? They found that no standard should be should be changed. We should just uh, not pay much attention to any of this new these new data. Uh, the one exception was the physician, who basically wanted uh, at least one part of the uh, of, of the standard to be be tightened. So what we've got is a biased group now going to provide. Uh, it providing before the COVID-19 begins a, um, a, a, a the, the ability of the administrator to say no change. And that's what the administrator says. We're not going to change the standard. There isn't any valid new, scientifically valid new data to justify making the standard stronger. Um, well, then along comes COVID-19. And remember, I said that it's the administrator who does margin of safety. And what margin of safety should you put in for COVID-19? And the administrator's proposals for, oh, for uh, particulates came out in April and, um, and for, uh, for ozone, I think, was in June. So he had plenty of time to consider COVID-19. And in fact, we know he considered it because he used COVID-19 as an excuse to pull back on providing uh, uh, oversight of various potentially polluting industries. So EPA provides less oversight to avoid COVID-19 complications uh, that might occur um, with, in terms of their, their, their workforce. Uh, hard to understand why these particular things, except uh, it does protect uh, potentially polluting industries. Uh, and uh, you end up with saying, so he, he certainly knows about COVID, but if you go through these 75, 90 page documents uh, uh, that have the proposed uh, uh, standards, what you'll find is only one mention in each of those two standards of COVID-19. Uh, that's to explain why you cannot use EPA's docket library, which is located in EPA's headquarters and in various EPA buildings around the country. You can't just walk into the library and look at, the, uh, at, at this Federal Register proposal because COVID-19. So we, we know he's aware of it. Um, well, why should he worry about COVID-19? Well, you've heard that there, there are some studies, um, uh, they've certainly been in the, in the newspapers, about the epidemiological studies associating past exposure with, um, um, uh, to uh, pollutants, uh, particularly to ozone and particulate, which both, both affect the heart and lung, with um, higher mortality from COVID. Um, these are the kinds of studies that, that KSAC would be looking at. And the CASAC approach, and I, I'm speaking now as an individual scientist, requires that there be statistical significance and, uh, you know, really a tough scientific uh, hoop to, to go through. Uh, uh, it's questionable whether the studies as presented so far would pass these hoops. Um, uh, let me just uh, point out, uh, those of us who live in, I still have a, we still have a small place in Allegheny County, so I still consider myself a Pittsburgh resident. Um, uh, Butler and Beaver counties, both to the north of us, north, northwest, uh, presumably very little difference in pollution. If you look at the, their, their findings, though, in terms of COVID-19 mortality, enormous differences, because in one of those counties, there was a number of nursing homes who suddenly became infected with high infection rates. Well, that, that would really make it very difficult to tease out any sort of uh, 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 air pollution, past air pollution effect. Uh, other things, uh, uh, we know that New York, and uh, particularly in, in Philadelphia as well, have high levels of uh, both COVID-19 and foreign travelers from the studies done on the genetic uh, uh, genetics of the uh, uh, individual COVID cases. Quite clearly, the, uh, at least for New York, the studies have been done about more than half of the uh, cases came from different European countries and had different genetic markers showing they came at different times from different countries, from different individuals, uh, as opposed to, say, in the West Coast, where it was almost all from China. So you're dealing with differences that have to do with, you know, the amount of people who travel to place to place. Uh, we have figures on international travelers into New York, perhaps in Philadelphia, but we don't have the we to say compare Cleveland and, and Buffalo and Pittsburgh. I, I don't think there's really valid data on the international travelers, but yeah, that was a large part of this initial. Uh, so between that and nursing homes, it's a large part of the initial death uh, rates. And 
uh, you know, these, these are not easy to do. And that's been Weaver's excuse. He's asked in the press, in fact, in the McClatchy newspaper chain, one of their uh, reporters uh, had, a paper, had an article in the uh, Pittsburgh Post-Gazette where he interviews uh, Mr. Weaver, the administrator of EPA, and he asked him about COVID-19. And Weaver's response is, well, my, my scientists tell me that we just can't be sure enough about the coronavirus deaths and whether and how they're recorded. And yeah, that, 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 that is a problem as well. But a lot of those issues will disappear um, uh, unfortunately, as we have this uh, during this, this current uh, crisis we're having with all the increased uh, uh, deaths, this is now a very widespread, the likelihood that, that so many of the deaths are going to be related to uh, factors which you just normally don't control for in usual epidemiology is now decreased dramatically, and we will be able to answer the question more directly. But again, that would be KSAC's determination which was made before the COVID-19. If we look at COVID-19, uh, as you've heard already, uh, and I'll speak now as a physician, I'm trained as a physician. I spent my first two months of my internship on the Bellevue Hospital chest service. And I did my, uh, I did two years in Los Angeles County General Hospital studying ozone as part of the US Public Health Service in the 1960s. So, and in the County General um, Hospital, I was on the pulmonary service. I've seen a lot of people with, with bad lungs. People with bad lungs are clearly going to be more at risk uh, to COVID-19. There is no question that long-term exposure to ozone and to particulates leads to a decrease in lung function, which we, I, I, I can't imagine does not increase the risk of dying from COVID-19. So you've got decreased lung function caused by the pollutants, but you also have another aspect of this that we're not paying enough attention to. You're first seeing a bit of it, but early on it became clear that those with COVID-19, even mild cases of COVID-19, had evidence of lung effects that were persistent. On radiology, it looked like scars. Well, most of us have a scar in our skin uh, somewhere from a bad cut, scrape, that never closed right. A scar is tissue that simply does not go back to normal. It's a fibrous tissue that's laid down to heal a wound. If you do that, you're going to have a lower lung function. If you scar your lung, scar your heart, and that's the same data that's being shown for the heart, x-ray changes, other changes suggestive of longer term effects, even in people with mild disease. What we're talking about with COVID-19 is increasing the number of people at risk to air pollution, not just past air pollution increasing the risk of, of a, uh, a lethal effect of COVID-19. So all of these must be taken into effect. They must be taken into effect as part of the margin of safety, because again, Congress said you have to do this. You have to take into account the number of people at risk and the severity of the impact. Mr. Weaver has th completely refused to do so. Um, I keep waiting any day now, they're gonna come out with the formal, yes, we're, we're keeping the uh, standard, and how he will handle the COVID-19, now that it's gone from the proposal form into the final promulgation. He's gonna finally do a final promulgation. To me, it's uh, uh, unthinkable that he will not promulgate what he's proposed, which is no change in the standard. Don't make it more stringent, despite the science, because he's got that KSAX, if you will, mostly support for that. How will he avoid COVID-19 in ways that uh, any judge will basically, uh, in the inevitable uh, uh, court cases that will follow, that, that, that any reasonable judge will say, but of course, how could you not have considered COVID-19 given all of this impact and given what Congress tells you you must look at? So that's my story. Uh, we'll see how it plays out. Um, uh, we're hoping that uh, maybe he will make a more stringent standard, but I can't believe that will occur. So I, I really suspect that we're we're looking at part of the of the situation, which means that uh, we'll it'll, you'll see you'll hear about it from the court case. That's inevitable. Thank you for listening, and I'd be welcome any questions. Okay, thank you so much for that stroll back through political environmental history. Um, does anybody uh, have any questions for Bernie? 
questions questions or did he dazzle you all <laughs> too completely? Ed has a question. Well, I kind of have a subject for discussion, especially looking historically at how Republicans in the past have been uh, certainly much more pro-environment than they are now. Do we have a, a good chance of kind of switching things back to where Republicans uh, are more reasonable about the environment? Uh, if that's a question to me, I, I, I will first agree with you. I, uh, now, I chaired KSAC under Ann Gorsuch. Uh, Ann Gorsuch came in as uh, Ronald Reagan's appointee as head of EPA. Ronald Reagan and Donald Trump had exactly the same rhetoric about EPA. Uh, Ronald Reagan, in the you know about the second year of his term, decided that uh, to get reelected, he needed to pay attention to the environment because so many independent voters were polling as they really cared about the environment. And so he fired Ann Gorsuch and brought in Bill Ruckelshaus, huh. and that's when I came in as as as, as uh, assistant administrator at EPA. Um, Neil Gorsuch, the Ann Gorsuch's son, who's a Supreme Court justice, uh, was quoted as saying when he was uh, being considered for nomination that he learned all he needed to know about politics when his mother got fired because his mother did absolutely nothing except what Ronald Reagan wanted her to do. Mm -hmm. So why am I going this direction to answer your question and to, to raise the issue? Um, yeah, uh, Ann Gorsuch just, just did what Ronald Reagan wanted, but Ronald Reagan most wanted to get reelected, and he saw the public as being sufficiently concerned about the environment that he better bring in this very liberal Republican Bill Rothko's house to uh, uh, to be the, uh, the the head of EPA and fire Ann Gorsuch. If you look at the Paris Accord and the U.S. pulling out of it, the press beforehand discussed. Um, that uh, Ivanka and Rex Tillerson were in favor of keeping, uh, uh, keeping in the Paris Accords and Steve Bannon was opposed to the, uh, to the Paris Accords and wanted the US to pull out. And I think the answer to that, the contrast with Reagan, is that Trump, with the same rhetoric to start with, believed that re-election was more important to him it, that, that to be re-elected, he needed to play to his base he needed to double down on what he'd said about Paris and basically pull out of the Paris Agreement, that he could not do any of these things that kept us in the Paris Agreement, even marginally. And I give my students uh, environmental policy, the, his speech on the Paris Agreement, he never mentions global climate change. He talks about the rest of the world screwing us and costing us jobs, and it's the same thing. It's just going to, this is the Paris Agreement just going to cost us money and claim that the U.S. is at fault. So what I'm saying is, do you believe that the, we've done a good enough job in convincing the public of the importance of environmental issues? Because I think that early on in the 1980s, when Reagan was first president, we had done a good enough job. People cared enough such that the Republican basically said, hey, I want to get reelected. Mm -hmm. So I better do something good about the environment and bring in this guy, Bill Ruckel's house. Um, on the other hand, Trump did the opposite. And I think you could interpret it. You can all, we can all, there's a lot of argument going on right now as to whether the progressive part of Biden uh, got, got him to vote or hurt him in the voting. Mm -hmm. But why do people not vote on the environment? Why do so many people support Donald Trump? Um, not as many as he thinks, but at least enough Americans do, that it really makes some of the environmental things we want to do very difficult. And I think it, it, that's the key to it. Where are the Ameri where's the American public on the environment and the things that Marin and people like Marin are doing to, to and the folks in, in the audience, I know, to try to get us to the place we need to be, where it's, it's a no-brainer for any Republican to say, hey, if I want to get elected, I better be better on the environment. I think that's where we need to go. Well, I, and I, let me also comment that we have quite a number of Democrats in our state who believe that they uh, need to be emphasizing fossil fuel jobs over the possibility of the green economy and dangers of pollution as well. So it's not just the opposite party we need to, to deal with. And I would argue that the, the Democrats in our state are, are the politicians are reflecting voting on. And we just need to do a better job to get people vote environment distribution. All right, we got our marching orders, folks. <laughs>
I have a question as well. Um, so from your experience, um, what's your take on the ruling on co-benefits? Because ozone depends on the benefits from particulate matter. They, they maintain the ozone standards now, but uh, do you think it's a threat for future reviews, every, you know, revisions of the, the, st the ozone standards? Yeah, the co-benefits issue is, is crucial uh, it, 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 in so many things, and it's crucial in global climate change. It just, it, 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 bring, it allows us, um, if you will, from a philosophical point of view to uh, link to the, the obvious issue, uh, obvious knowledge that we have that, that all of nature is linked together and uh, these standards don't sit by themselves. That's just the way we, we, we approach them. Uh, and in order to look at the, uh, benefits and when the, the law allows us as well. So I, I, I otherwise I don't I don't think I really have an answer. I think you in a sense you've answered your own question in, in by, by by phrasing it the way you did. We just we just need to be able to do a better job with that. But we're a nation of laws and we're really tough on the legal issues. Um the legal issues of uh, are co-benefits allowed? Well, that uh, that Supreme Court pick that we recently had is is not going to help us. Yeah, it's a hi, Bernie. It's Neil here. Um, very interesting to hear. Uh, and I was going to ask exactly Edson's question because of the the position on co-benefits uh, and just an, a, a sort of a reflection on that is essentially all of the health benefit from reduced PM 2.5 was actually before the PM 2.5 standard went into effect. It was because of ozone, you know, catalytic converters for ozone and sulfur scrubbers for acid rain and other things. And just as an observation, under the current interpretation, none of those, you know, of, of order 50,000 saved lives per year and whatever the dollar, you know, avoided cost of a statistical life on that is, that would all be disallowed, right? Yeah, so. Neil, you've got, you've, got, you've got it right on. And in fact, I think your, your example of, of uh, uh, the, the uh, acid rain issue is, is, is crucial and it's very, um, I, I talk about it a lot to health scientists because uh, basically to me that acid rain issue and, and way back when, when I was at EPA, I actually was responsible for the acid rain research program that uh, the government put, in, put into place. That, that, that acid rain issue is, uh, was originally just seen as an ecological issue. It didn't seem as humans were being affected. We, we just talked about this in terms of the trees and the lakes. Mm -hmm. um, and in fact, this was uh, not just trees and lakes. It was trees and lakes, but it was also humans. Mm -hmm. And uh, that, that, that the idea that you can affect trees and lakes or any other biota and not affect humans is one that we just got to get over. Mm -hmm. And we've got to get over it. We've got to be able to count the various benefits across the various uh, uh, disciplines and various kinds of, uh, of biota that are on this planet, including humans as biota. Mm -hmm. And a similar um, perceptual uh, Tack is Laura made a very good observation in the chat. Too many people see that there has been positive change in the environment and think we took care of the problems. Nothing more to do in their minds. Um, oh, well, yeah, because it, we we don't have to turn on the streetlights at noon as we were talking about before you got on the call. But it doesn't mean that there aren't still problems uh, with the air, and not to mention everything else. And Michael had a question. Um, from what you know, were there decisions on the national to local level downstream that were shaped differently as a result of the EPA data that was fiddled with or removed for some time during the past administration? By past, you mean the current one, Michael? Meaning the like climate data that was taken away? I'm assuming that's what he meant. Yeah, this, this current administration. The hopefully uh, soon to be past administration. Yeah. The, <laughs> what, what the what the Washington folks often don't recognize and, uh, and that uh, people who, like you and who are in your audience uh, today do recognize is the impact on the local level. But that impact is very often hard to see. Um, you, know, it's, you, you spend 
we spend an enormous amount of argument uh, on only what's the right risk number for uh, uh, a certain chemical that, uh, you know, formaldehyde, pick, pick your chemical that's in the national uh, uh, spotlight and uh, come up with approaches that are simply not thinking of well, what happens in a local neighborhood if somebody happens to, to dig in their backyard and finds a buried drum of something. And how do we go about facilitating what happens in the local uh, area to, to do that right? My impression is that most of the regional offices have done a really good job at EPA at shielding themselves at the local level, at the drum in the backyard level, from the, the what happens and what has happened in the central administration. Um, that the central administration cares enormously about particulates and ozone and other major things which affect the fossil fuel industry and some of the other supporting industries, but really hasn't messed all that much with, with uh, what the regions do and that the regions have by and large been doing their job. So it's, 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 that's a way of saying, I'm sure there are specifics, I'm sure there are times when the administrator's office has picked up a phone and called a regional administrator and said, do you realize that what you're doing is bothering so-and-so and, -so? and uh, wink, wink, uh, uh, I'm not, it has nothing to do with, my phone call has nothing to do with the fact that he, he strongly supports the administration and has donated, he or she for that matter. So it, it, it's, just, it's hard to know on the daily activities. My perception is that, that by and large, the, the, the career staff at EPA has done a good job of uh, shielding uh, local decisions from, from uh, the major problems. I've got another one as long as I've got Bernie for a, um, <laughs> how much know. from, yeah, no, no, no. It's, it's, it's your perception that the, uh, from your experience in EPA and on KSEC, how much, it's my impression that right now, as you, as you said, they're going to promulgate the regulation that the administration is hurriedly attempting to stitch up as many, um, policies in as, 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 uh, as firm a way as possible. In other words, to make it as hard as possible to undo what they've done. And what's your, I mean, you have an inside scoop on this. What's your, wh how, how much can they do right now that, that will be very hard to undo and how much will be relatively easy to uh, retract? Well, the, 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 the nice thing about executive orders uh, and, uh, and, uh, you know, Obama was the first president to come up with really a, a very large number of executive orders. The nice thing about executive orders is they only uh, need last as long as the president is in power and the next executive can come in and just reverse them. Um, and so a lot of what's been done can be reversed. Other things that have gone through a formal process, such as, uh, uh, and certainly the Clean Air Act uh, things, uh, there will be, it, 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 if we can't overturn them, using such, I mean, there's plenty of bases that I gave in you to overturn them uh, in terms of the processes and, and, and other things. Um, uh, the Clean Air Act standards are going to be around for five years. We won't have the tightened standards that we really need to have um, for another five years minimal. And again, if uh, if we're talking about a five-year time period, that will be after the next president. and. Uh, I can't promise who the next president, uh, what the next president will think about the five year, about these uh, ozone and PM 2.5 standards. So, I, I mean, I, my, my answer is the classic professor's answer, which it depends. <laughs> Is there any any state control over this sort of stuff or is, is it all federal? No, the, the states have a lot of control. And in fact, uh, my major, you know, the major long-term worry about the, the packing of the Supreme Court, if you will, with conservatives, uh, is that um, uh, some of the state 
federal interactions will be greatly changed by how you interpret this. For instance, the Clean Water Act, and uh, many I'm sure in the audience know, know about the waters of the US and the, uh, President Obama uh, uh, basically changed the definition under President Obama, the definition was changed by EPA and the Army Corps of Engineers on what constitutes water of the US to include um, places that may dry up for most of the year, but be around for a short period of time. Um, and uh, that was, that the battle on that was, it was a battle that really, uh, you can't point to the classic individual uh, polluter. What you're dealing with is a lot of folks who strongly support uh, reversing that, which is what uh, uh, this Congress did and the President uh, Trump signed off on, reversing it based on property rights issue. I mean, who the hell's a bureaucrat in Washington tell me what to do on my, the pond in my backyard? But the Clean, Air, Clean Water Act depends upon that. Remember, we have no, uh, the Constitution of the U.S. does not have any statement in there about the environment or about health for that matter. Uh, they're, they're, they, and our constitutional, almost uniquely of constitutions around the world, gives anything that isn't that specified to the states, uh, isn't specified to the federal government, rather, belongs to the states. Almost every other constitution, basically, you know, in Germany, education belongs to the, to the, to the, to the, to the states. Um, uh, but if it isn't specified, uh, anything that's not specified in the Constitution is belonging to the states, belongs to the central government. We, uh, we're the opposite. And so since neither the environment nor health was part of uh, the original Constitution or any constitutional amendment, um, we've got to figure out a way to get the states uh, well, to Pennsylvania agree to this. Does we have, have a hard time doing it. Pennsylvania but, does have a provision in the Constitution for protection of health and clean water and air and et cetera, et cetera. A lot of fat good it's doing us. Well, I, well and yeah, also, I'm sorry, fortunately, about air, that. Yeah, yeah, air travels across straight boundaries and that makes it commerce because it's gen the pollution is generated by commerce. So the commerce clause is a wonderful thing. Yeah, but, but, but the way you just said that, uh, you'd have a bunch of conservative lawyers jumping up and down and saying they're going to find a case to get that reversed under the present Supreme Court. Mm. Yeah, you know, so you, you, we, we've got to really be careful about these constitutional things. Um, and uh, you don't want to give them the right case. Mm. Uh, that Clean Water Act one will, again, I mean, you, you, I've got a slide with uh, uh, Joni Ernst, the, uh, the senator from Iowa who uh, uh, headed that uh, drive in the, in, in, the, in the Senate to reverse that. When Obama vetoed uh, the, the Senate's override, the, the, how the Congress's override of, uh, of, the, uh, of what the Army Corps of Engineers and EPA did to change that, when, when Obama vetoed it, he made a strong point about we've got to protect against water pollution. And she, she made this very indignant comment, which is, it's not about pollution. We're all against pollution. It's whether or not we want a bunch of unelected bureaucrats in Washington telling us what to do in our backyard. That's a very compelling argument to a lot of people of the kind of people who voted for Trump. And we've got to recognize that as being what it is. And the worry boundaries about of the backyard are are fluid well i guess neil was just talking about airs flowing across state lines and and the idea that i should be able to dump whatever i want you you use the term pond in the pond in my backyard pond is fundamentally different than the stream in my backyard because the okay. stream is going to somewhere else Marin, I agree with you completely. Yeah. I'm, I'm merely trying to- I'm put, just saying why that what argument- you, What you're gonna hear and what we have to recognize is where people are coming from. Mm -hmm. uh, I did a paper on, uh, in, in a journal called Energy Policy uh, on uh, basically the sustainability. I chaired an academy committee on sustainability at EPA and looked for where the opposition was and was surprised to find it coming more and more to the center of the uh, Republican Party based upon property rights. And mm -hmm. you, you've got a strong anti-sustainability people. I mean, some are French folks who say it's the UN trying to take over uh, American property, but some basically quote from John Adams and, and Thomas Jefferson and the Constitution, and our Constitution says life, liberty, and property. property. And gee, 
what do you mean? You want to you, you want to put a bike path through my property? I'm sorry, Neil. You look real good on a bike, but who the hell are you to decide? You know, to, to, to say they should. And that that's a major issue. There's an attempt to put a bike path along the, the upper Mississippi River, and again, it's running into property rights folks who believe very strongly that property rights are really number one. I'm I a roadie. I stay on the roads. <laughs> okay. I mean, I would love to take a bike trip along the Mississippi, but you know, it, it's it, 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 that is a that is a real argument that we need to be able to confront in an era where sustainability can't possibly be done if everybody just puts a fence around their backyard. Can uh, to what extent can states have stronger standards for summer all pollutants than the EPA? Well, it, 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 again, it depends. The, um, there was a strong push, which Congress, I think, mostly rejected, that states uh, could not. Um, uh, the, in general, in the past, before recent years started to overturn some of these things, uh, a state could have a stronger pollutant, uh, pollution standard but could not have a weaker one. Mm -hmm. So um, the whole California issue, and California has been crucial in terms of getting certainly uh, controls on 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 uh, on vehicle transport, I mean, without California, we, there were so many things that we wouldn't have been able to get done, uh, because they're such a big market. Uh, they just basically, if they say mm -hmm. you've got to have uh, controls, you know. and if you want to teach about how, uh, oh. Uh, how you how industry may not be always believable. You can just go through some of the the, the California efforts. Every single one of them uh, in controlling automotive pollution, the, the industry said it was not feasible to do this. There was no known way to do this. How could you set a standard when there was no possible way of doing this? And by God, they did it. So, yeah. So the, the 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 policy issue of forcing standards by laws is is uh, the california experience is, is the basis for saying yeah we can do that um i'd like to po propose that we have a program of starting pig farms by the strongest property rights advocates <laughs> yeah there's there's a wonderful story perfect out of, idea uh, the, the hunting country in virginia where uh um, somebody tried to put up a second home for his mother-in-law or brother-in-law or something like that on their property, but the uh, the acreage was, since it was defined as a farm, he was not allowed to have more than one home on that size mm -hmm. and based upon his neighbor uh, protest. So what he did is he put a, 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 a pigsty immediately <laughs> <laughs> upwind of the neighbor. There you go. Said, hey, you go to court for about now. <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but now you're talking yeah. about a nuisance law, the pigsty, and 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 that's you know there's a lot of a lot of our air pollution laws come out of nuisance uh, laws, come out of uh, classic common law thing about your neighbor can't be a nuisance to you, which also doesn't work. We have it in Pennsylvania, we have it in Allegheny County, and still stuff happens. Oh yeah. Yeah, they're Whether really, really hard by to industry enforce. and by individuals. Yeah, yeah. And, and you get, I mean, I saw the, uh, the, uh, the issue, uh, wasn't there to smell it, of hydrogen sulfide, uh, smellable levels of hydrogen sulfide in, 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 in uh, near uh, um, the U.S. Oakland. deal. Yeah. I mean, that's, uh, uh, that's disgraceful. Uh, and it's the kind of thing, though, that I you start getting into the issues of how to deal with that. You have to you have to be concerned in this day and age of um, not focusing on the health effects when it's not directly a health effect; it's a nuisance effect. the 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 standard for sulfur dog, for for hydrogen sulfide is not set at, at health effects level. It's set at a uh, there's a look at the California Air Resources Board uh, review of it. It's got a very nice thing where it flank, it says flat out uh, car, uh, hydrogen sulfide at these levels does not cause any health effects. It is not set to avoid health effects. It's set to avoid the nuisance level. The, Maybe the mental health effects. I'm sorry? 
Mental health effects, maybe. Well, yeah, perhaps mental health effects. But it's not a physical health effects. And the reason I raise that is because um, I would worry at this time of COVID, if you've got early COVID, the usual thing for most of us is to let it go a day or two before we get tested. Uh, there's always something we're doing today or whatever. And I hate like hell to people thinking, oh, I'm, I've got uh, some nasal irritation, some throat irritation, uh, but I won't get myself tested with COVID. It's probably that hydrogen sulfide. That's what's doing it. And so we've got to be careful as to how we present that to the public. Yeah, we got to do something about hydrogen sulfide. It's also indicative of a lot of other things that are getting out of that uh, coke works but mm -hmm. it's 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 not itself causing the throat and, you know it needs a irritation and if you got that maybe you ought to get get yourself tested well that's an interesting yet another correlation uh or influence between pandemics and air because if if air pollution is masking mm -hmm. symptoms of a pandemic that could have health consequences when you go untested and assume it's just that, just as someone might assume it's just allergies or whatever else it resembles. Yeah, exactly, um, exactly. Although I must say it was never until January of this year during an illness that I had that I had ever lost my sense of taste. Why did it wait that long? But Neil has done the statistics and claims up, down and sideways it couldn't have been COVID. Well, if you want, I guess you can, you could go look and see if you've got antibodies. I could, but it's hard to justify. I yeah. think I should just be careful because even if I had antibodies, maybe I could still carry it to someone. Not that our president would believe that, or maybe, <laughs> <laughs> or maybe some people do get it again. And I'm just trying to operate responsibly and not, I, I don't know. I don't, I don't know how to go about getting a test. So. I suppose it would be an interesting finding. Yeah, but I've, you look it up online and that is a symptom. I forget what it's called, but it's a symptom of like flus, which I'd never heard of until COVID. It's like, oh, I had that for the first time. Could also be zinc deficiency. <laughs> interesting. Yes, uh, uh, it, it, this is an obscure, obscure, and pay no attention to it. Mm. And by the way, zinc uh, to some oh. people uh, is supposed to protect against COVID. So. Well, it's supposed to shorten the, the length and severity of any old cold. So I, yeah. I can't remember if I took it, but I might have early in that illness. Um, so a little bird told me, let's see if she's still on board. Um, that uh, one of our attendees has had, speaking of COVID testing, has had quite a bit of uh, frontline experience. Uh, Karen, are you still interested in sharing some of your experiences with that, mostly in the testing realm? So you can tell us what is happening. It's not specifically related to air, but people on this call might be interested. So, Karen, are you still with us? I think your name is there. Karen Campbell, are you there? I don't know, you'll have to unmute yourself. But anyway, she mentioned earlier that she might be willing to talk about that, but maybe she had to step away. Oh. Oh, that's weird, I can't hear you. You're not muted, but if you're on a phone, maybe the phone call has its own mute that overrides the Zoom mute. Looks like she's muted to me on, it says mute. It says not muted to me. Oh, that's fine. The top of the screen, her name has a mute under. Um, uh, well, I will try to unmute there. That's weird. I can't do it despite my hosterly Exalted hosterly status. Hmm. Anybody remember how to unmute a phone? Because my participant list says that you're muted, but the window says that you're not muted. Maybe I'll mute and then unmute. There's some sort of code involving asterisk and pound sign that you type into the phone. Like star six, maybe? 
Try typing star six, Karen. Well, she's there tantalizingly, tantalizing us with all this experience. I would look, uh, Karen, in the phone, since if you're on a phone, maybe the it, through the phone call might be muted. In the meantime, I can invite you all to share the traditional salon pesto. Greg has some watermelon to share with us as well. Oh, well, what's everybody else having? But in, first off, I'd like to, uh, before we totally digress, I would like to thank Bernie profusely for uh, rising to the occasion of plumbing disasters. And um, you kept whipping around on my screen. Uh, plumbing disasters and computer failures. And Greg is showing us something. Yeah, so star six toggles mute to unmute and back again. Star nine raises your hand. Ah, good. Thank you. Oh, I, I can oh, you yeah, hear me now? Yes, yes, great. Oh, okay. okay. Oh, good. All right. Well, a um, couple of things I wanted to um, bring up is um, that, and it's a problem I ran into at work, um, with if... If you were exposed to someone this morning, you should not be going to get tested this afternoon because you are definitely going to be negative. And then um, a few days down the road, like possibly four or five days, then you would actually test positive. But since you have a negative test, you aren't aware of that. And then you're making everyone sick. And so everyone that came to where I was working um, was just tested no matter when they were exposed. And quite a bit of it was, um, you know, just today or yesterday. And so when I suggested that we screen that, I was told it was not part of the policy. And so a whole lot of people are not uh, being tested properly. Um, hmm. so, and, and then there's just like, um, we were given a gown that we wear all day. Um, so if I see you at 8 AM and you do have COVID, then I'm sharing you with everyone all day. If there is any droplet or something on me that could get to you, you know, that's all debatable, but it just seems bad <laughs> to what wear the, the same gown all What day. is the current testing? Because I know it used to be you'd stick a Q-tip yeah. to tickle your brain, and right. now we is it have just a nostril big, swab? Right. We did have a big, long nasopharyngeal pharyngeal swab, and which was quite uncomfortable. We now do have, um, it just goes into your nostril on both sides. Mm -hmm. Not comfortable. It usually makes everybody's eyes water. Hmm. And um, but not horrible, you know. And um, so we have one which is the most accurate, which is um, one that it usually takes a few days to get the results back. Uh, but nobody wants that one. They want the rapid one, um, which is a very inaccurate, especially concerning uh, negative results. Um, there are many false negatives. Mm -hmm. And so for a long time, they did this thing where they would do the rapid, and if it was negative, they would do the send out one too. But as we get more and more people coming, um, wanting the uh, testing, then we get um, more, um, uh, you know, like everybody's in a bigger hurry. There's just too much, too much going on. Um, and, you know, like, a, you know, you're seeing like 60 patients a day and you're seeing them outside, which Neil would like the fact that we all have to wear the, um, the big shield over our face outside, how ridiculous that is. Um, but um, just the, the, the whole thing is, um, 
well, it's really underscored by the fact that really whether I test you today and you're negative or positive, I'm going to give you the same advice either way. I'm going to tell you to go home and stay home for 14 days. So uh, I'm uh, really kind of debate on whether or not we should even be doing all this testing. Um, this, uh, there's just a mass quantity of it. There'll be people come in and these were retired people or whatever, you know, my husband tested positive, so I want tested. Well, of course you're positive. You know what I mean? I mean, if you all sleep together and everything, you're positive. But, you know, and why would you need a test anyway? You know what I mean? You just stay home. But um, it is just such a mess that it scares me. <laughs> so anyway, I, um, I just, um, you know, the president and everybody, the president-elect, I should say, um, uh, they all want more testing, but I think they don't realize how much of the testing being done is just this way of making money. It has nothing to do with actually taking care of the public, you know. Mm. Uh, it's just, um, it's just a big money maker. And so, and the testing should be free, but what they do is they charge you for seeing me, which is kind of a joke, because I'm seeing you outside very quickly, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's just for money, the whole thing. Hmm. And Lord knows how many people are told they're negative and they're not. Um, so, you know, it's just a, it's just not being done right. And it's not just the clinic where I work, but um, at pretty much all the clinics, because if I tell somebody I don't want to do, you know, a rapid test on them because they're asymptomatic or whatever, then they say, well, they got one a week ago at such and such, you know, and I'm like, you know, so there's just, um, it's just, it's really a huge mess as mm. far as, um, how all the testing's being done. So I, I wouldn't rely on it. <laughs> um, it's kind of amazing. Mm -hmm. so. And we have one other uh, a practicing physician, Carrie Henligill, uh here with us, who first off put a note in the uh, chat in case anyone is interested in joining a vaccine trial. There is one uh, still enrolling and she gave a link to that. And do you have any comments on the testing situation, Perry? And have you been seeing much uh, COVID stuff happening where you practice? <clears throat> I mean, I've been seeing, yeah, I've been, <clears throat> I guess I have a bit of a different perspective on the testing because uh, I'm not seeing the the population of people being tested. I'm seeing people who are sick or have been exposed and uh, in from what I'm seeing I'm not seeing the testing uh, that enough people are being tested or that the results are coming back fast enough because people have bosses who demand they come to work unless they've you know um, got a positive result I see people who won't stay home until they've got a positive result uh, it's it's uh, it's a really big quandary, but it makes a huge, huge difference if people know they're positive. Yes. Well, my that's the thing is that the they all want the negative test, and they don't care if it's inaccurate. So if I'm telling them, well, if I test you today and you were just exposed yesterday, then you're definitely going to be negative. Well, they're they're happy with that. They want that. They don't, they don't, you know, they just want to go back to work. So. But are you seeing people like at a, at a CVS, people who just um, are coming in without a doctor's orders? All of them are, they're all without doctor's orders, but it's an urgent care. And so I'm, I'm, and many of them are quite ill. You know, like there's some people I've had to just send on to the ER. So I have had people that were very ill and then, you know, just um, many people who are, it's just stressful all day long. Every person you talk to is upset. They either are 
sick and don't want to go to work or they're not sick and they want to go to work and or their boss is unhappy or they're they have a baby at home or there's just always always they're just so upset all day long and when you see like 60 of those you know it can get um just very stressful and um i i just don't think it's being handled the way it should be handled and um people shouldn't be forced to go to work positive to and go with a negative test and that sort of thing so like right now i'm <clears throat> right now i'm in ottawa and it's the rules are different here like if you have yeah. a test pending you're not allowed to go to work or school right. um and you need to you know someone needs to order the test like a nurse has to assess they're not going to order your test uh the next day after exposure now that's awesome so I so wanted that here. There but should there, be, you should be able to tell people, no, come back in three days, you know. <laughs> right. They won't let me do that. Hmm. And they, they don't that want the nurses. work that way, does it? No. And what, what they're doing, too, is they're going outside and they're sending the nurse out, uh, or not even a nurse, like a nurse assistant, or maybe even the radiology tech who isn't taking an x-ray right now, just whoever. And they're going out and they're just doing whatever test the patient asks for and getting their vitals so you're sort of told what uh, has been done before you ever saw the patient and i wanted to kind of switch that around and they said no because that would make the people going out have to go out twice for each patient and um so then i suggested they we have someone that stays out for you know like an hour and they all take turns and um that didn't go either they just got really upset with me you know i was a pain in the butt and um end of discussion so Marin. i just said that Marin. did you mm -hmm. i'm a doctor too i feel oh yes well you're luck. retiring oh. yes so ed well, i ain't retired yet and i may start practicing. <laughs> and at any given time i'm looking at my screen and i'm seeing what i'm seeing so i'm sorry oh, okay. i didn't i i I had I looked around and said any other doctors and I didn't see you you must have been on the other page oh, okay. so I apologize we have two two physicians plus Bernie who is an environmental oh. physician right uh, not an epidemiologist he says but an environmental physician and professor of and, and you're muted Bernie so you're still muted <laughs> He's just, now, you're, now you're invisible and muted. So, Karen, are you going to talk to the press or like what, you know, like what policy uh, measures would you advocate to stop this uh, inappropriate utilization, do you think? I don't know. I do have um, a phone meeting with one of the doctors in charge um, on Monday, and I wanted to see what he said. And, um, you know, it's, it's a little, <laughs> you know, cause I don't, I, you know, I don't want to raise a big stink, but, um, it's being done wrong and, mm. and, for, and, and for massive amounts of people, yeah. you know, if I'm seeing 60 and I'm working with two other providers and then every clinic in town's doing the same thing, um, and, you know, it's just, um, and then, you know, you hear other providers say things like, if they say they're asymptomatic, I don't even go look at them hmm. and stuff like that. You know, you just hear things like, oh gosh, that's probably not good. You know, cause well, a lot of people will self-diagnose too. They'll say, no, I have no COVID symptoms. Okay. So then you go see them and they are sure they have a sinus infection. So they start telling you about their sinus infection symptoms which are actually the same as the COVID symptoms. Mm -hmm. But they have, they have previously diagnosed themselves with sinusitis and not COVID. Mm -hmm. So you run into that kind of thing a lot, so. Um, Another testing question is, does the, for the PCR test, which I think is not the same as the rapid test, is that right? Right, right. Um, it's more in the standard of care. Um, 
if it comes back particularly fast, is it more or less likely to be accurate? No, no. It's just a matter of, I don't know, how when busy they the lab it? is. Okay. Ours go to lab core, and, um, you know, unless, uh, I know the last day I worked, there were, um, they were a little, they were behind a, an extra day. Like they usually take two to three days and for some reason they were all of a sudden taking three to four, mm -hmm. but we were also a lot busier. Mm -hmm. So maybe they were two or, you know, it's hard to tell, but. Um, but know, the I test mean, is the, the swab with its stuff in its tube is, is stable until right. they get around to it. So. Well, supposedly, yeah. And it's, it's supposed to be like frozen and, you know, there's all sorts of variables, you know, as far as, you know, um, did the person doing it shove it up in your nose far enough and just all kinds of, you know what I mean? There's, mm -hmm. there's variables, but uh, I, most of them mm -hmm. I think are done correctly. Um, I just feel like most of them are done too soon. You know, I had a man, uh, that's when I got in troubles. I had this man and his son come in and the son had been exposed at work um, the day before and the father lives with him and so I mean the son couldn't even be positive yet let alone the father from being with the son so you know so they then were upset that no one had mentioned this previously and they'd been waiting an hour or so to be tested and you know and so that's when I suggested that we you know we we um, discuss this with people ahead of time and you know, and I just got in trouble. So I just, <laughs> it's mm -hmm. a mess. It's just a really a mess. But, um, and everybody's just way too busy. Everybody's, you know, they're, they're losing nurses and people like that pretty quickly. And, you know, people are leaving because they're just way kind of overworked, I guess. Mm -hmm. <sighs> yeah. Are, do you have any feel for whether the huge numbers that we're getting now relate, I mean, what Trump was saying early on was, well, I don't want more testing because that'll make our numbers look worse. Yeah. And in his case, it was obvious political. He didn't want his numbers to look worse while he was, you know, still looking ahead to try to be reelected. And, but the numbers, I mean, there was X level of concern in the spring when, okay, will the next county report be single digit or double digit? And then it sort of crept up and then it went back down and now it's 500 a day. So is it, do you, do you think that, well, do you have a feel for how, whether there's a lot of asymptomatic positives that previously were just going and circulating and now they're finding they're they're having more reasons to come in to be tested and they're turning out to be positive and they're going into the number where previously they just would have been undetected well one thing is um every clinic kind of does it different um well, that's does, helpful yeah and it depends on how the doc feels and like i know one clinic they um they just pretty much refuse to do the rapid testing because they have had people who tested negative on the rapid. And even though they talked to them and told them this was not accurate, um, when their other PCR came back, um, they were positive. And when they're called and told they're positive, well, they've been to school, they've been to work, they've been all over the place. And, um, you know, so I know some docs won't do them at all. And then, um, you know, it's just, it's kind of a mess because I work at a lot of different clinics. Mm -hmm. So everyone does it different. You know, um, there are, there's one clinic that doesn't do any COVID or respiratory stuff. And I know I uh, worked there and I had a guy come in, an elderly man, and I, his truck had run over his foot. And so he came in for that and I was, listening to his lungs and mm -hmm. his lungs sounded awful. So I did a chest x-ray and he had pneumonia 
And um, everyone was immediately extremely upset that this respiratory patient was in the clinic. Mm-hmm. And I was like, well, what did you want me to do? Make him leave because he's sick? I mean, what do you, you know, because I wanted to go ahead and do like a COVID test and stuff like that. But everybody was, you just wouldn't believe how really upset everyone was that I wanted a chest x-ray and that, you know, all this stuff. And it was, it's really strange. It's very, it just depends on um, who's at what clinic and, um, you know, right. Just, it's the it, weirdest thing I've ever run into. <laughs> I've never seen anything like it because I'm used to working um, like inpatient or something where everything's kind of the same, you know, and just, um, really strange but uh, it's been an experience but yeah the uh, impact on the health workers of all echelons has been tremendous And you also have experienced personal loss. Yeah, my mother, um, she was 93 and, um, of course, had lots of comorbidities, but was totally fine until um, November 6th. And she tested positive for COVID and and she died November 18th. Mm. um, So I know, you know, a lot of people would say it was all the other stuff. And, you know, she's 93, she has all these comorbidities, but she had COVID. She had COVID. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I know people fuss over what's put on the death certificate and that sort of thing. But, um, you know, that, that was the, that was the uh, you know, the icing on the cake or whatever. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, my father died. Um, late spring and of symptoms that could have been COVID. He had congestive heart failure, so he had fluid in his lungs and he couldn't breathe. And talking to him on the phone, he did not have COVID, um, but talking to him on the phone, I was thinking, boy, this must be what it's like to have COVID, at least part way. And Mm -hmm. uh, I didn't accomplish him that day, I don't think. Um, I don't know how he sounded right as he was losing the battle. And he didn't have a ventilator or anything. He was, um, yeah. Uh, well, we didn't, she didn't have a ventilator either. She was a, she had made herself a DNR just mm-hmm. mostly because she was 93. But I'm getting the impression that most people who go on ventilators don't come off of them. That's what uh, it seems. It's about 50% last time I saw a statistic. Oh. That, well, that might be a, for some, a lot of folks to try for. But yeah, even, I mean, even people who have a mild case and then have permanent lung scarring or the 18 year old uh, friend who went to Europe for college and they had them tested before they left and tested when they arrived and, and, uh, and then they all got COVID anyway. And, um, they were young and they had, you know, they got over the case of illness, but they're having weird follow-ons and swollen eyes and, uh, who knows what, what kind of lung damage that would be permanent permanent Mm -hmm. uh, impairment so this is not a pretty thing Mm. um thank you for sharing your insights all of you docs ed is still there you keep moving around that's your problem ed you keep moving around on my screen (laughs) do you have any covid related uh tales of i'm just doing inpatient um we um the numbers went down so low this summer we just thought oh okay not so bad and it's pretty uh, pretty awful how they're peaking mm-hmm. i don't know about peaking yet but going up anyway so 
have people looked at the and this might be a question for for bernie um have but also uh all of you doctors and nurses and things um is there any perception of the impact of trump's uh unmasked crowded rallies i know that Partway through the campaign, there was um, there was some work, some studies done that showed that there was like after a rally came to a town, there was a bump in COVID numbers. But towards the election, he was having them so frequently in so many places. Has anybody been looking at um, that more recently, or anybody know what? I'm been sure studied? they have, and, and but the thing is. Um, okay, his, his rally's got to be super spreader events, but yeah. the, in general, just the, his bad example. And oh, yes. If that's the main thing to me, I think. I mean, um, I think way more people would be wearing masks uh, if it were not for him. Mm -hmm. And he blames us for... I don't know if you heard this, but he said that uh, doctors are are misdiagnosing COVID nineteen because somehow he thinks we're going to make more money. From oh, yeah. that. Right, that's like climate scientists. I mean, talk about an insult! Even I have this staunch Republican friend, and I said that to him, and he, he usually has a quick, uh, quick answer to any criticism. But he said, "Yeah, that was a low blow." <laughs> Any comments, Bernie? As you monitor the public health data? Bernie, you're unmuted but invisible now. <laughs> well, well, I don't know if you can hear me, but it's been an honor having him participate in this. Yeah. It's, um, thank you, Bernie. I'm not sure you may have stepped away. Um, but it's been quite a rousing salon. Thank you. The next one will be on December 5th and I have not figured out the details, but we will have it, I think, pass up April. Is that right? Before you sign off? What's that? April thirteenth. April, so. April, and Ed. Oh, I'm gonna def I'm gonna defer to Ed for that. I haven't been paying too much attention to the steering committee. Okay, so pass Hi, Ed. Good, good to hear you. Okay, well, um, thanks for joining us, April, and uh, we'll not see you around the hood. Um. Uh, yeah, April and Ed and I of those that are here are all on the steering committee of Pass Up Pittsburghers Against Single Use Plastic, which was featured at a salon two years ago. And I always do in December, the December salon, I usually do early in the month and with a topic of um, consumption. Uh, my devious idea is to send people forth into the holiday season to buy less stuff. Um, yeah. And this there's, year, it's all complicated by COVID. There's a instead of Black Friday, there's a "Don't Buy Anything" Friday movement. Oh, that sounds like a great movement. Yeah. Maybe we could do a salon on medical waste. But that's for goodness sakes a huge topic. Yeah, one of the early salons uh, was partly about that. Uh -huh. um, but it's been a long time, and it could roll around again. So, any other salon topic suggestions here? I don't know if all of these people who are muted and invisible are really there or off having dinner. <laughs> <laughs> but it's uh, great to, oh, there's Patty, hey there. Um, I think you said in chat that you needed to put out at some point. No, you just said thank you. Okay, well, I'm very glad mm -hmm. you could join us. And I saw your email about the masks um, and mm -hmm. we will figure that out. Okay, thank you. Um, so uh, thanks for thanks for joining us. And that sounds like a great idea. Patty runs the fitness 
department or something at, at Carnegie Mellon and is talking about trying to get masks for her fitness instructors. So, so anyway, yeah, these masks are just. Elves and Outback. Okay. Where they belong. Okay, could you put it on the court? Yeah. Uh oh, someone needs to be muted. Should I bang it in? Ah. Uh, <laughs> Bernie's probably still dealing with his plumbing problem. Um, and I just popped over here once again for those who joined uh, too late to see Allison's presentation early on. Um, but this is the wonderful Breathe 99 mask which seals beautifully and has a very high-tech filter that Allison was the engineer of. Um, that is a replaceable filter, but the rest of it you can use, well, indefinitely, I guess, pending the lifetime of the elastic. Um, and uh, so this is what I wear when I'm going into stores um, or in any crowded situation, like say a protest or anything like that. In fact, I know that Greg, who was on here recently, had one because I saw him at a protest. So here we have this fine example of a mask. Mara, and I have a question about the filters. Yes. Do you think mm -hmm. they could go in that UV light that sanitizes them to um, reuse them or no? I, well, Allison, Allison is not here. Let me, sorry, I have earbuds, so I have to make you dizzy. I have changed them once. And I was basically, I was, uh, I changed them the morning of election day. Uh, and I hadn't really noticed a deficit in their breathability. So this is them after they were used for a while. And I kept them because, um, you know, maybe at the other end I'll run out. But I thought I might be doing, needing it all, all day long on election day. And I didn't want to compromise anything. There's, mm -hmm. there's, um, my thought on the UV sterilization is I put it out in the sun and I put my own mask or the cloth masks also out in the sun. Uh -huh. And I have washed the cloth masks a little bit, but it's like the nose piece on the homemade ones is a twist them and I don't want the elastic to get heat heated too much. So I've only washed them a little bit and I'm not out that much I'm not out working all day every day so I have used the UV of the Sun um, just as I've used it for laundry for mm -hmm. for ever and um, uh, so I've used UV um, but it's as much I mean I'm not a healthcare worker so I'm not in a place where I know there's a lot of people with COVID so I actually, when I put it out in the sun, I'm mainly sunning the inside because it's had my breath on it for however long and I don't want it to get murky. So mm -hmm. that's most of what I'm washing off. The outside, I'm not, like if I was a healthcare worker in a COVID department, then I, I would want to sterilize both sides. <laughs> I would probably wash mm -hmm. them more frequently and I would um, put, you know, I would just turn them over in the sun. But mm -hmm. they're... Um, so yeah, so it, I mean, it depends on the application. And if you were a healthcare worker, you would change the filter every day. And if mm -hmm. my cousin who is a preschool teacher and is 60 years old, um, wears hers all day. And so she probably changes it, I don't know, once a week or something. And I change it mm -hmm. after two months of mm -hmm. occasionally use because I thought I might be using it all day. And, I, and again, the breathability of it would decline I think, and I, I didn't notice a huge change when I went to the new filter. So okay. I just don't think I've used them enough to really worry about. So that's why I've kept this other spare filter. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, so, uh, so yeah, I, they're, they're not perfect. They don't fit every face. Um, sometimes I do need to readjust it a little. Um, uh, my older daughter, um, her face is bigger. Neil's face is taller and has a beard, so he doesn't use them. He usually used one of Keelan on the theory that he was supposed to go in and teach every so often. Keelan made him a whole bunch of these, which fit me like a tent. Uh -huh. 
um, reversible, isn't it? You know, we've got yeah. the tree side and the green side. Um, and I have one that, and Keelan just was really in, made a whole lot of masks. And so I have a one with chickens on it that oh. is, um, uh, one with chickens on it that has ear loops and one with sunflower on it that has a strap behind the neck and a strap over the head, sort of the same as the Breeze 99. Um, and they just slide through in this case. Uh, and mm. she always makes like a little chin thing. So, she, so it's the best fitting one that I have is this one I'll put on. And here with these, the main thing that might wear out is the uh, elastic, but that can just be replaced because it's just through loops on the sides. I have to uh, sort it out from my earphones. Where don't anybody say anything important. I have to untangle my earphones, which are totally lost. I'm sure that was very rustly to listen to. Well, I'm in every day, and so I wear a mask all day, and then I wash mm -hmm. them every week. Mm-hmm. This, so I wear a different mask every day. Yeah. So this oh, one. I like that. Yeah, this one that Keelan made, and I can show you from the side, it really mm -hmm. seals quite well. This is the mm -hmm. one that, this was my favorite one if I needed to go into a store before the Breed 99 came. And here it's got a double, two twistums of the wide kind that they have at the co op. She's also used the sort of stiff plastic kind that comes on electronic wires when you buy a oh yeah mm -hmm. device she's used those for the nose piece and this one really seals quite well it does i i don't imagine it's it has three layers of fabric and the center layer is very um uh as tight weave fabric as she could find um but it doesn't have you know the fancy high-tech Four layer filter so I still think this one is probably better protection but this is mm -hmm. my next best mm -hmm. and it's also because you have to get the elastic unlimbered it's a little slower to put on this one has the strap behind again with this really fine velcro so while the strap can get tangled in my hair the velcro doesn't pull my hair okay. which um, well you have short hair so Mm -hmm. even know this but if if I ever had velcro touch my hair anywhere except like here I could pull it out and if you put mm -hmm. velcro on your head on your hair you could just pull it out but if I get velcro stuck here the hair will break and pull mm -hmm. and so having something velcro on the back of my neck is a terrible terrible idea but this velcro is like the really fine kind so it sticks to itself properly but it doesn't pull my hair Good to know. Oh. Thank you. So we'll be in touch about the masks and such. Okay. Okay, great. Thanks. And um, I think we're, we're about ready to wind down, I think. So <laughs> thank you all. Thank you, uh, Karen and Perry, for sharing your medical uh, experiences. Thank you, Bernie, for um, uh, sharing your years of political and health history and insights with us and um thank you all of the rest for coming 